which is a center with potential for excellence in biodiversity. And I am being the student of molecular endocrinology and reproductive biology. We did some work and uh, some of the work on female reproductive health. Today, I shall try to convey this message within the my time more than half an hour. I shall try to I shall try to complete this within that period. So can you get the yeah? Can you bring the strip below? Yeah. Please make it in the presentation mode. Please bring the strip below. Yeah, okay, it is fine. This is not working, I think. I do not know. This is not working. It is not working. No, it is not working. Yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. It's okay? Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you very much. So this is, uh, I am trying to give you a message on these things. On phytocompounds as the bioactive molecules on female reproductive health. And uh, as I told you that I'm coming from Arunachal Pradesh. Arunachal Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh is a biodiversity hotspot of Eastern Himalayan region. And these are different tribal groups, around 125 tribal groups. And these tribal groups are very really wonderful. They have different culture, different systems. And in all these different cultures, different systems, there are many illiterate people, but these illiterate people are much more wiser than us regarding the traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge system. So we try to tap some of that indigenous knowledge and traditional medicinal system. And being the student of life science, being the student of zoology, I tried to validate some of these compounds, some of these medicinal plants, especially for female reproductive health. And just one slide that I am just giving you, it's just a site on this state. It is geographically a big area, it's 3,000 square kilometers, altitude from 100 to 7,000 meters. Some of these areas totally snow covered down the year. And that area is the treasure of medicinal plants rich biodiversity of flora and fauna, and there are about 26 major and 110 minor tribes, rich traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and rich healing traditional practice they have. And this practice is different in different uh, uh, tribes. But most important to how we tap, tap that and how much we understand these, their practices, it is very important. Many things we do not understand their practices, how they are going on. Now we're coming to these things, reproductive health, it is a new concept. Earlier, this concept was different. That was a family planning, these, that. But as soon as we are giving step in the 21st century, it came to the reproductive health concept. And in this reproductive health concept, maternal and children health and reproduction regulation. Earlier, it was the concept of reproduction control, but now it is the concept of reproduction regulation. This concept has come. And in both the male and female, this though it is taking part in this process. When we have did the survey in Arunachal Pradesh, we got that one. If the, some medicine is pro-fertility, we got some pro-fertility medicine also, then these folk people, they'll, my dear, this medicine only for men. And if some problem in the women's reproductive health, that the menstrual cycle problem, mainly menstrual cycle problem, painful menstruation, then abnormal cycle like that one, or the, suppose they are, thinking for safe termination of pregnancy then in case of uh, that one only in female case otherwise for proof fertility maximum in case of male one so how this just i until few dimension of reproductive health multiple dimension of reproductive health infertility is one of the major problem nowadays it is earlier it was not in our country but last two three decades it is increasing immensely in india also and in Infertility, if we see this IVF, IVF rate is only 30 to 40 percent, 
and some are dear, which is called unexplained infertility, when all parameters like sperm counts, hormone, sorry, unexplained infertility, when all parameters like sperm count, hormone profile of both the partners are absolutely correct, that is, de that is defined as the unexplained infertility. It also we get in our society. Irregular cycle and painful menstruation is a big, big problem among the women. It is very difficult to catch it because many times people, the women, they do not express it because of various our societal uh, this systems. But it is true. If we get the very, if we use the students, students is our best instrument. We use the students in our Azib Gandhi University. We tell them you go to the village, especially in the MSc projects, and they can get the best of best data. In that case, we get that there is a lot of women who has this type of problems. Hormonal imbalance, especially estrogen, it is a very common one. Estrogen and FSH, these two are very common one. And problems of endometrial proliferation and differentiation, another problem is recurring abortion. Recurring abortion is another problem in case of women. So this, all these things, there are many answers in Indian medicinal system we have. It is knowingly or unknowingly, it is like a golden spot in many of the areas of our country. Now our duty is to put it last, bring it to our lab and we have to do the, go for the, just yesterday, what about this, this is drug development, we should go for the drug development. So I just, I am uh, requesting our new generations that give the interest on the students and it is a very, very interesting subject. And if we go for this interesting subject, I hope in coming years, many of our brother, our sisters and mothers, they will get rid of many of these problems. It is not going, my dear. Please check that one. Next one. Fertility control. If we go for the fertility control, then this, to stop undesired pregnancy. Stop undesired pregnancy is another big problem. It is unknowingly or unknowingly, it is happens. So sometimes we feel that, yes, we do not need that pregnancy, and that pregnancy, we should terminate it. But nobody should know that one. And at the same time, my mother, that means, the, our mothers and sisters should be safe when you're terminating the pregnancy. Development of non sterile contraceptives, whatever contraceptives is there, it is still going on all over the world. In 1988, the WHO made a task force for development of the non contraceptive tablets or medicines, but it is still not, go, uh, not found a proper one. But I hope that India is the answer. The India is a place where this answer is like that one. We can, if we go for that one, then we can get, get a non sterile contraceptive drug and implantation drug. Anti-implantation drug, why? Because until and unless our mothers and our sisters, they going for a normal cycle, they never thought that they're, they're getting, has a problem, they are facing some undesired pregnancy. One, once their menstrual cycle is stopped, then they're scared of that I may be get pregnant. So in that time, what happened? Already it is got implanted. So we need a medicine, which is a short time, short term, that means, very far low duration you can use that one and we will be the our mothers and sisters will be free of the implantation and if implantation is going on already it is implanted then how in the early stage we can go for safe abortifacient that means some compounds should be there some medicine should be there where you can do that safely that this implant is which is scientifically called the abortion so these are the women, are, our mothers and sisters, they're facing this problem. They are being the student of science, so life science. We are responsible for giving the answer for these things. So some of that type of things, phytosteroid can be used as a potential reproduction regulator, either anti-fertility and pro-fertility. Just I want to take one, one minute to give a, tell you a story, that one, how we have get this information in Arunachal Pradesh. In Arunachal Pradesh, the tribal community, yesterday we have a lot of discussion during our dinner time and lunch time regarding the cultural variation. The, many of the tribal communities, they have a tradition that they maintain their pigs and dogs in the family. It is a culture. And they think that pigs and dogs, especially dogs, they are the forefathers. So they should maintain their at home. But problem is there when their population goes high, especially pigs. Pigs is common in each and every family. When the population of pigs is going high, then the, the elderly people in the family, they see whether the female pigs, swine, it is mated or not. If it is mated, then what they do, they make some medicine, herbal medicines with food, yes? And after that, she does not give birth to any newborn pups. 
and that was the clue and that clue we brought some medicines from there i will show you some plant here and we saw that when if this is the principle of this traditional medicine it could be either anti implantation or abortifacient and we got that one yes really if we test it in the in vivo system that means either in mice or rat then we saw that one during the peri implantation period i will show you here the peri implantation is a very critical period of the embryo development during that period that medicine kills particularly targeted the embryo and kills it i will show you simply few of that the tribal communities of arunachal pradesh has a rich tradition of traditional medicines can you go for that one it is not going again yeah they use medicinal plant for various purposes including reproductive health this is one medicinal plant which is used for uh, treatment of the painful menstruation say is a uh, person from namsa area which is a buddhist area another one scoparia dulcis scoparia dulcis could be available in round the india it is a south indian plant it is there it is used for many different purposes this is another question somebody may ask you sir how one single plant may use for different purposes it is used in different purposes and it could be answer it is in the with the new generations we have to find it out how the same plant can be used for different one cyanoglossum zainelicum another plant it is mainly in our place we get it because it is high rainfall area where it is the in that area it grows paris polyphylla paris polyphylla i think you have known that when it came in the news also that it is expensive it is grows in the lower himalayan part could be it is not in this side it is so far as my knowledge is concerned it is in it is endemic to that eastern himalayan region this is another one it is high altitude plant this is this caterpillar fungus i think many of you do not know that one it is called as indian viagra in some length when i delivered the lecture of biodiversity then i delivered the lecture on these things it is a highly this is sold dear but not publicly very high high cost medicine dear it is generally it is available more than above 6000 feet of the uh, hillside where it is always snow covered tenacicimens is another this is used for pro fertility i am showing you showing you some of this plant not all this plant we have tested some of this plant i am showing you these plants are using for both pro and anti fertility purposes now we are coming to this this three plants we have studied in our lab with the some analysis not all the analysis because if i tell the all analysis a huge huge work it's a very costly approach but some analysis we have done how these three plants scoparia dulcis cyanogisosalum elirium this plant mainly used for the abortifacient this plant has different purposes and we targeted at one few parameters only where you can prove it okay in these parameters this plant sir yes or no and before that what i will tell you that one we have studied in our whole program experiment during this period gestational period of the mice in this can we skip this part that is this one hello my dear can you take this one from here to below or somewhere yeah if we see the mice gestation mice gestation is 21 days program 21 days duration and in during this 21 days duration 1 2 3 and 4 this is the pre implantation period during this period the embryo comes to the mother's uterus but it does not attach with the that means it does not get implanted but on day 4.5 it is implanted and mice reproductive behavior rat reproductive behavior is thoroughly studied Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory has published many books on these things. This is thoroughly studies. Nothing to there is nothing there is to be any confusion about here. But some systems, are, yeah, some systems are variable. And five to eight, this is called the post implantation period. And from day four to day eight, it is a very critical development of the embryo. It is extremely critical. For mice, it is twenty one days. For human being, accordingly. For other animals, or also early this time is there. and during this period if we see in other including the omen the recurring abortion takes place during this period and during this period lot of things are happens we cannot define it properly that this is the responsible this is the this is the hormone this is the growth factor no we cannot do these things is that hundreds sub factors are responsible they work together just like us they work together and it is very difficult which is the responsible person which is the responsible factor for maintaining the whole system so this peri implantation period we make a target and we what we did we determined the threshold dose yes and that threshold dose we did the administration from day 1 to day 7 yes 
and day one to day seven and day four. I do not show you the all the data because time limitation is there. From day seven, day four to day eight, what type of changes we get? I am showing you here. When before that, what I want to show that one? How the normal development normal normal development takes takes place? On day six, yes, day four point five, it is implanted. Day five, we get the implantation. Day six, we get the implantation. This is a very easy experiment. Chicago blue dye, if you get, get the injection, then you can get the, this implantation sites in the mice uterus or relative, relative uterus. But it's more or less similar, but we do the experiment in mice because it is less expensive and it is easy to maintain that one. So whatever I am showing you here, all are in mice research. So these are the implantation sites and our target is all in the implantation sites. We'll see what type of changes takes place. And we have targeted only two to three factors like that one. I will show you here. This is the embryo. You see that one, this embryo has just, it is called hatching from the, this uh, capsule, zona pellucida. When it comes from the zona pellucida, then this embryo just attached with the maternal, uh, this endometrial, this is the endometrial tissue. And this, this embryo attached with the maternal endometrial tissue. And in case of other animals, we do not know the psychology, but in women, we know the psychology. Once the women get pregnant, psychology changes. Why the psychology changes? This embryo, as soon as it comes to here and attached attach to the maternal uh, tissues, it gives a signal to the mommy, me agia. So you give me the food and shelter. Yeah. It gives a signal in his own language, in his or her own language. What language is that? Biochemical milieu it gives a signal. And accordingly, the mother gives the shelter here. And if the mother cannot give the shelter here, yes, it will be either anti-implantation or after a few days, if it is get aborted, then it is an, that the mothers fail to give the shelter or the food. These are, these are very interesting. It is so synchronized, fine-tuned manner. It is more than Lata Mangeshkar's song extremely fine-tuned manner, which is a mystery and we believe in God for that one. Next time, this embryo goes like these things on day five. And if you see that one, it is a very, it is the, this face, this main vesicle where it is, goes inside, this is the embryo. And these are the cells. These are the cells that are most responsible cells. Yes, if you see these things, these are the multinucleated cells. And these multinucleated decidual cells, which is called decidual cell reaction, is a major responsible area which gives the shelter to the embryo. If we can manipulate this this year, decidual cell reactions, decidual cell reactions, what? Just an example I'm giving you. A girl was below nine years, is, she's, that below nine years we call in Hindi in bacha, yes? And that bacha was with a small pen and a shirt, it is in father's lab, yes, but as soon as she grown up, pubertal is coming, menarche is started, then she does not, she wants to sleep alone. It is like, just like this one, the stromal cells immediately converted to the decidual cells, and this mechanism, how many genes are involved in decidual cell reactions, nobody knows as on today, we did not find any paper in any research, in any research journal of the world. Day six, it is giving, it is, it got elongated. It goes elongated, three germinal, three layers, whatever we have studied generally, it got like this. And these are always still, it is getting the, the support. That means this, the embryo is getting differentiated. It's an every minute, it's an every second, this embryo is differentiated. And until and unless I think we can elucidate all these things, it will be difficult for the scientists to develop a drug. And what is this main important is this one. This ectoplacental cone has been de developed. And these ectoplacental cones, number of different type of cells have been de developed here. Different type of cells. One cell is divided, divided into three, four different type of cells. And they take the different type of functions. And this is the main target area, therefore. If we can manipulate it, if we know the physiology, if we know the functions behind that one, then I hope we can develop the medicine. And you see the structure, it is like an, it is just like I tell my students that it is just like a rocket that they are very eagerly waiting to come to the earth from the heaven. It is just like a rocket. It is just eagerly waiting to the, come to the earth from the mother's womb. And if we see these things, these are, these are all differentiated in different purposes. If we see these things, these are blood vessels because the embryo is growing. And for growing embryo, the mother have to give them more spaces. So two things happens together here. One is apoptosis. Mother's tissue get is a programmed apoptosis so that the embryo can be accommodated in the apoptosis whole areas because it is growing one. So it need the apoptosis here, all the blood forms so that the embryo get the 
this all the nutrition here and at the same time amber is, is structured properly because not a single gene have to be deoriented otherwise if a single gene is deoriented i will lose my this finger i will lose my one lens here i will lose my hairs here so different actions may be uh, happened here so all in organized manner it happens and here in this case in our uh, research what we got that vgfc and its receptors flk take a major part vgfc why vgfc mainly involved in case of vasculogenesis blood vascular system and what our experiment was that this the medicinal plant extract that they this medicinal plant extract partially it may affect on different areas partially it affect on the expression of vgf and other two factors i will show you here and finally on day 8 it gets the destructors on day 8 this is, it is again it is moved and structure started to organize to start and from day 8 onward gradually other functions grow and from day 8 onward if we remove the ovary also it does not make a sense in absence of ovary also the or this embryo can grow proper and finally we get these things newborn pups in 21 days can you can you bring this uh, strip here and this is this formation of this embryo it is an integrated cross talk and support of ovarian hormones and the number of factors result in a healthy newborn baby it is not only the ovarian gonadal hormones ovarian hormone ovarian hormones and the other ovarian hormone dependent factors ovarian hormone dependent factors which are work together yes it is not only the faculty members here if the student does not come to the class class cannot be held if students come this the research does not come the class cannot be held like that when it is an integrated approach and in integrated approach we finally we got these things so this is the normal development and in normal development what i am showing you this one it is just like these things it is a city is a bomdila city of arunachal pradesh a beautiful city and in within the city just i am giving an example within the city we do not know how many things are going on there only we know few things na yeah? okay there is a monastery there is a temple like this this working but detail study if we know that one then only we can unravel the history of the birth that is therefore we believe on the god that it is our god gifted children so now we are coming to these things can you make the strip dear senses my dear can you can you sense the strip bring it below and this relation if you see then as progesterone is the main hormone on day for estrogen receptive uterine receptivity is there the uterine if the uterine receptivity is not there then that means the mother have to be receptive for the embryo and that is called the uterine receptivity that is the major problem of infertility then blastocysts active then the attachment will be there on day 4 this stromal cell singular single nucleus chain cells this is a difference of eight and after that and some round secretory epithelial like cells termed the deciduous cells after that some not only these things i am showing you only this one is igf2 hoxa 10 and vgf 3 and these are integrated in our experiment yesterday i told some scientists that sir what i believe that one what as on today it is said that er alpha and er beta has only one root of functions i believe if our new generation study then it may be it will be able to discover some different diversified area of this root of its actions what i believe on that one from our experiment so this three igf2 hoxa 10 and vgf c if we see that one we studied that one we saw an altered structure i am not telling a bit this is a less or more or it is a decrease and this it is not like that one is an altered structure it is deviated from the normal fine tuned structures how it is gone can you do it it is not going again next not going again yeah this i told already yeah next yeah hoxa 10 igf2 vgfc express spatio temporally in a time and space it is very much specific in which time in which cell it will be expressed it is very much specific and if we can deviate from that one then there is an abnormal development of the organs 
E2 and P4 are the prime regulator. That is right. But E2 and instead of E2 and P4, it is not the only E2 and P4. Suppose there is a class, yes, and the class representative or union secretary told today we do not do the class, yes. Then all students will go out of the class. Teachers will be there. Vice chancellor will be there. Everybody will be there. There will not be class. Like similar things, we have to think for that one. This all these things happens here. This is the it is a design. What I just want to show you that one. This is the embryo. And in this embryo, when it comes to attachment of the maternal tissues, then different hoxatin, then blood vessels, IGF2, IGF, IGF2, VGFC, all comes together and work in an integrated systems. Now we are coming to these things, how in normal structure it develops. If we see these things, it is so, it is organized that one, it is a primary decibel zone. And in primary decibel zone, yeah, sorry. A primary decibel zone and primary decibel zone, this VGF does not express. That means the, the embryo first does not initiate the VGFC, but the maternal tissues, they started the VGFC in the normal development on day five of the gestation period. Once it is going ahead, then it starts and the, the category, that means the pattern of a, this expression becomes higher and higher. And that is also specially, it is different cells because the embryo is attached in this side only, not in this side. Yes, this when embryo is attached in this side, in this side, the VGF signal is more. As of course, there are some uh, this, um, wrong signals also. And that wrong signals, we can calculate that one. So therefore, we can tell it that it is very spatio-temporally expressed, this all this um, growth factors. There are many other PGF is there, leaf is there, but we did not study that one, we passed on list three. On day six, we get like these things. This is a gate becomes elongated. And some of the cells of embryo also started to do that one, express that one. And surrounding the embryos, this VGF is properly, it is, it is started to be expressed. So VGF is an established one, Law, many papers. Can we take this uh, step to the top? I'm giving a trouble because some publications are here, I think. Or if I can minimize this one. Yeah, yeah. Don't mind because I'm giving a trouble once and ag once again. So VGF like this, and this is, we have to sense it again. I think this is in hoxaten. Yeah, this is hoxaten, and this is hoxaten. Similarly, if we see that one, this hoxaten is found in embryo itself. It is this is the embryo elongated embryo on day six. I am not showing you from all four to eight because a lot of time constraint. Also, I have to finish my within the time. But selected point where we have to give the attention that I am showing you. Hoxaten is found in this is normal eosin hematoxylin stain. We do these things because so that we know the structure. Unless and otherwise we do these things, we do not know the structure because when we use the FITC or Texas red, it does not give us the structure. The structure gives the only signals and that signals we can count it. So this is in situ and this is normal HC uh, sections. This is the embryo and in embryo, this hoxaten is precisely, it is hoxaten is a homeotic gene, transcription factor. And hoxaten has the relationship with IGF2 and PGFC. And hoxaten shows that expression during these areas. All these areas it expressed very clearly. We are coming to the next one. Can you go to the next slide? Below there are some publications because of the strip. I think you may not. Yeah, hoxaten has been localized in the embryo in the strong signal. If you see this spike, you see this one, this side. The blood vessels are formed here. This embryo is attached here. I'm telling you that we do these things to load the, know the structure of the embryo. Here, we do not know the structure because no signal is here. Here on these things, the embryo does not get the expression of this hoxaten. But here, where blood vessels, like a flanking zone, yes, just like a bird wings, yes, it started to develop this blood vascular system. And here, this hoxaten has been extensive, very strongly expressed. Therefore, we thought that one, we do not know what is the relationship i am i beg apology for these things if you ask me sir what's the relationship of hoxat and pgfc we do not know that one what we know yes when pgfc is expressed here hoxa is also expressed here that means it works together what type of work crosstalk is there that we do not know what pathway it follows that we do not know but we know that it comes together so once it is their imbalance then maybe if my, I'm here, but our director of is, is not there. I feel embarrassing. Sir, muskutura neglect kiya hai kiya. Yes, like that one. So it is the same feeling like here. 
So it have to be what I'm telling is a very fine tuned manner. I'm just giving a light vein. Do not uh, take it uh, in other ways. That is more than the Lata Mangeshkar song. Lata Mangeshkar is our queen for us singing all over the world. We proud of her, but it is more organized than that one also. It is because there are thousands of genes. I do not know that one. Thousands of genes work together in a very precisely manner. What for? To make a good creation of God. And this is the Texas red. So if we see the Texas red IGF two, can you see this one, my dear? Yeah. So it is IGF two. IGF two. It is an. Uh, it is an IGF two VGF and uh, ovarian steroids progesterone. And here one more question comes. Somebody may ask you, sir, from where this estrogen comes? From where this estrogen comes? That we do not know. Long back, 2009, there is a published paper that the stromal cells is the source of estrogen. But I do not know that one. After that, it has not been. Uh, it has been done. But definitely, if we block this one, if if we see that the blockage of the ER and PR have some effect. Next one, can next one, please. Next, it is not going next. So estrogen and progesterone, the ovarian steroid dependent factors are the key, key players for the successful development of the pregnancy. And here estrogen, progesterone, hoxaten, IGF-2, PGFC, and embryos ultimately comes to the embryos for the development. They work in a very precise manner. Bioactive compounds from plant extract induce morphological and bioactive senses. Some of these plants are dear. Can you sense this? I'm telling you to sense this. Some three compounds we have studied that one. Yes, these are the we studied these things in the mice, and what will I do not go to detail one because time constraint is there. I think I have only ten minutes time. I will finish it. So I will show you the final results. What is there? These are some compounds, forty-five compounds we we targeted from some extract, and within these forty-five compounds, can you go to the next one? It is a ZCMS for fractionation. Next, yeah. This, yeah, take the strip from here. Yeah, these three compounds. If we see that when we will make the docking studies, they show the maximal binding affinity with the refer of reference compound. Reference compounds means estradiol 17 beta. So whatever knowledge is about here, that if this binding affinity is more, it it should be that one. This compound bind in a better way with the ER receptors or PR receptors, whatever we'll study, than the this native steroid. So that is on that thinking we are going ahead. Next one, it is not going to. Next one, not yeah. Similarly, another three compounds showed much more. It has the 94. The estradiol has 94 binding affinity, but these three compounds have showed much more binding affinity with estradiol receptors, 95, 100, 112. So. For these things, when we got this type of compounds, then on that basis we selected that plant, sir. This plant could have some effect on these medicines, and actually that plant is referred by the villagers, sir. Baba, they call this Baba or Bopa in Assamese language. Baba, this is the medicinal plant which you can use for this particular purpose. So these are the same. Just I want to show you that how they are. We have done the docking studies. We are not going for that one. This. They have shown us this type of docking. I do not go much more explanation here. I just want to show you the final result. These are the docking pattern. All this we have shown because not only that one by one experiment you cannot come to the closure. You have to do two three experiment where all this have to be corroborative, supportive to one another. Yes, suppose I am here today, but actually I am not here. I have gone somewhere and I reported my university. Okay, I delivered the lecture this and that. Okay, but it is a no wrong one. Then what you will give that? Oh yes, sir, master, not giving the lecture here. But if I am here, you tell me. Then our expert tell the sir, master has given the lecture here. That means yes, he has given the lecture. So this experiment should be like that one. Only one experiment we cannot come to a conclusion. On support of that experiment, we have to two, three other experiment also. We have to. Yes, if I am looking you, you can recognize me. That type of experiment have to be done, and we have done the things. And by that one, I am showing you one of this all these three. They show this all this binding pattern. That means affinity of these plants with the ER and PR both. And finally, we are coming to these are all the the results. I do not want to explain all these results. All these results only required that whether it has the binding affinity or not. If the binding affinity is there, next one we have crude extract. My dear students, I am telling you, we did the experiment with the crude extract. Which crude extract? Where the maximum this compound is there, 
because we tested many plants out of plant we selected that plants where these compounds are there that crude extract we used and from that one what result is there or we come to the conclusion on that one now we are coming to back again these things i what i showed you that one we collected the sample on day 8 yes day 8 means i showed the here only on day 8 because of the seminar but when my did the phd student not only day 8 they have studied from day 1 2 3 from 1 to 8 because you have to make a seriality otherwise the expert will tell sharma why you had not did not do this work but being the as a lecture i'm just showing you that day 8 few results i will show you here hoxa Ten. If we see the hoxa ten, yes, you see this structure here. Yes, here now question is there. Sir, your student is a bad student. They are unable to do these things, and therefore eosin and hematosin stain is more. Not like that one. It is not these things. If we see the earlier picture, is a clear picture. Here, this is a different one. It's a dark structure. Dark structure is a, it is a signal of death of the cells, and that is being reflected here. If we see these things, yes, the VZF, sorry, hoxa tens signal here is much less and similarly others also their signal is much less in this area that means gradually it is coming that means it is withdrawing it is unable to do their work and when till withdraw in one day it is withdrawing yes one day withdraw means sufficient if i suppose somebody don't like me immediately go out of that one that is sufficient for me that that's not liking me right and suppose I am very much, I'm not angry with you. I'm very pleased. Just I am telling you, I'm angry with you and I'm telling so busy. I may sign a big. Yes, like that one. The one cup of tea is sufficient to tell that I am not happy with you. So here, this withdrawing is sufficient to tell that it is not happy with the total environment of the this one. If we see these things, IGF2, IGF2 is a, one of the major structures. See the structure, what elongated structure should be there. From here is a dark structure. It is, a, it is a, a bit different one. That means already it loses its organization. Already it loses. It knows what happened. So they do not know these things and it's, it's lost its orientation. And these things we send, we get a different signal. Looking at this, we do not know whether it is less or more. But when we calculate it, I will show some calculus when you calculate it then it comes obvious whether so significantly less or significantly more similarly if we see that one on day seven you see gradual decrease of this hoxa and igf2 igf2 is a major factor for this implantation and pregnancy development so igf2 and vgfc it loses and ultimate structure date in the embryo is a resort structure totally resort structures completely Reserve. So these things I do not know. Sun or about efficient. Efficient means this should be removed from the uh, this uterine tube. To ask me, sir, I am sorry. I cannot tell you. I can tell you only these things. The ball is in the future generations. We have to do line by line, and then we can get the final result. And if we see this one, finally, I am coming to the final stage because I am time is over. I think. Disogelium arium, that was the first work which we published in long back, 2013. I am unable to show you because of this. Uh, okay, it has come here. Some of the publications I think you did not see. It is all our recent publications, 18, 19, 20, 21, some 22 also. And here, if we see these things, you see that one. This this the normal structure, normal embryo, and it's so precise. These are the things. These are attached to the maternal tissues, but the embryo goes properly. And here, it is lost it. It has got disoriented all are and deserting embryo. So by these things, I want to conclude my lectures and uh, we are coming to the end. Some just, I want to show you the structure of the VGF. If we see the VGF, then in this plant by Western blotting, when we have studied, this plant extract shows a new protein, 43 kilo delton proteins. This 43 kilo delton proteins, what the function is there that we do not know that one is a VGF expression in an altered manner. Another one, Hoxaten, if we see, it is a totally absent on day eight. Hoxaten and IGF2 has a difference. And from day five onward, day four onward is started, yes, but maximum reflection comes during the post implantation period. So it is, we do not know whether it is, it is this, uh, this PCR reactions. When you go for the PCR reaction also, it is easily reflected that day seven and eight. That means when the organogenesis start, it does not allow. It do not, not allow for organogenesis. Start from day four onward, 
and up to, up to day seven and day eight, it complete your its works. Finally, what I want to show that one, this is the design for the whole work. We have published this recently, this one. This normal development here and here this in this um, embryo surrounding the cells, which is most important, the decidual cell reactions. Here, what we believe that one, this any compound, whatever we have studied, we do not know which compound that we did not study that one. We did not tag the particular compound. Bind with the hoxatin because hoxatin is a homeotic transcription factor. And this homeotic transcription factor, when it binds there, then it is the key and um, key factors which give the uh, direction to the other factors, IGF, then VGF, all this, leaf in that you do like this, you do like that one. And ultimately, whatever it will give the uh, instruction, you will do it accordingly. And therefore, these medicines, we collect the medicines from the villagers, they tell it, Baba, use these medicines because they do not know that we are going to do the experiment in mice and animals. They think that they are uh, that uh, I'm taking my medicine from my wife. Yes, I do not have my wife. Sorry, I'm single. So, but uh, just I'm telling him that we are taking my for my wife or my sisters. But it's not like that. And therefore, they tell like Baba, pregnancy period me usko nahi dena hai. Like that one. Suppose I'm bringing the medicine for irregular menstruation, painful menstruation. They will tell. They will give give the medicine only during one and three. Like that one. So we have to understand there that wise decision. We have to understand. We have to analyze it here in our this, our own computer, and then we have to apply in our medicine. So we did this experiment. So we are coming to the end. So this is what I am telling you that I am coming from Arunachal Pradesh, and it is a beautiful town. Yes, and it is beautiful town. Sometimes many many people yesterday, sir, I think asked me, sir, some some question you put put me regarding the Arunachal. Beautiful Arunachal Pradesh. Come there, this is a land of Buddha, this is a land of peace. China cannot do anything. They do not have, they never think like this in 1962 India. Now we think in India, Modi is India now. So come sometimes, a beautiful place. It's only one place, extremely beautiful. So thank you very much. And this is, uh, I have some acknowledgement. My main collaborator, Professor Vel Murugan from University of Madras. Whatever this docking, analysis, all these things, whatever we have done, we have done this CS and crystallography and um, that is their physics and biophysics and crystallography. And uh, finally, my students, all my, all my students there, all this thing, all the students, some part they have done their work and uh, latest ones, a PhD student, one uh, thesis submitted. And luckily I am proud of telling you that one, the one of the examiner from this university of this thesis and another was from Italy. And privacy was conducted from Italy, the expert, I was unable to come invite the expert from this university. So with this word, I'm uh, thankful to all of you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And thank you for a nice deliberation. Maybe I have some quick questions. Sir, please have the seat. One or two quick questions. Sir. Yeah. yeah, Professor Murja, thank you very much for your this question. Yeah, it is a very good question that, but what from our experiment and what literature is available on these things? Because many of the synthetic compounds is also uh, now, now tested in different universities. And what we believe that mm -hmm. one that uh, these compounds have some, definitely some receptors. Without receptor, they cannot do these things. And what's the function of receptors? Function of receptors is just like the soki that deer. If soki that is deer, if somebody comes, they will ask you, sir, tumko kya hai idhar, idhar meeting chal hai. And this compound will come, modulate the receptors, bolega, maybe attend karega. They will come. come. So, so, definitely receptors. Now question is that one. Whether this compound, it is a new one, but this this is true. What we are showing is it is true. Road, 
they work through ear pair insulin is a different receptor this compound may also have a different receptors receptor assay we have not binding assay we have not done binding we have seen that one by this that one this uh, uh, the structure the uh, in silico studies but in silico true in all times in silico is yes i am not debating for that one i am not disregarding that one but that in silico may not be a system and in vitro system similarly in vitro system in vitro experiment 100% may not be trans system so sir what i my submission is that one it may have some other root of action also it is up to us but if you can solve the problem what problem is for pain, painful menstruation is a big problem if we can solve our problem until and unless we find the proper pathways we can use the medicine the problem yeah these are all phyto compounds phytoestrogen means we are telling phytoestrogens phytoestrogens are not the estrogen compound it binds with estrogen receptors they are for phytoestrogens but what sir question is yours that it may bind some other receptors also so no, tomorrow nomenclature may be different one as we go inside then we get some new part like that one so now it is a phytoestrogens because it binds with ear but it may have some other receptor too that we do not know that one eratinoic acid yes yeah yeah yes Yeah. 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 Retinoid and then riboflavin carrier protein also was studied a long back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That is an another area of research. What I am telling you that I did not use the. the pure compounds here three compounds we did not use there we use the total uh, crude extract of this plant where these compounds are there that it and one more thing is there what compound we have reported here only from the libraries only from the libraries but in the plants there are many other compounds which is not in the libraries so when we are using the crude extract i i am studying these things but actually there is another compound is here standing here he is doing or he or she is doing the whole work that we don't not know because not in the library so it may be also happen so if we go for this uh, nmr and other studies then we may get some new compound but i am very much sure india is the answer 2016 so you got the nobel prize for the artemisin yesterday i heard that artemisin is uh, regarded as a sinus plant no my dear artemisin is very much available in arunachal pradesh and from long years from centuries artemisia is used for anti malarial drug among the people, tribal communities of arunachal pradesh but we are ignoring ourselves so similarly in coming few years my new generations much more intelligent they develop some medicines targeted medicines where we will be given this type of answers where we are facing the problem lot of other problems are there irregular menstruation abnormal bleeding my next lecture will be eating ovarian cyst then pcos polycystic ovarian cyst syndrome and in fact it is a big problem those parents knows what the, what is the pain of not having a children so this we have to being the student of science you have to give the answer for this thing yeah not mention south indian pain i think somewhere <laughs> not south indian south asian south asian region it is available So in Nilgiri areas, it is by another by the place of spot. It could be deer. I I did not tell you intentionally because some of our work still remain to be done. I told you some six compounds here which we studied, and I told showed you three plants. Yes, one plant is Dysozelium is not in this area. Dysozelium is uh, it is. Especially in Arunachal Pradesh, it is endemic to that one. But other two plants are available in here. Scuparia is available in this area also. Cyanoglossum zinelicum. I can I can give you the name, no problem. Or you can get it in the net also in all our publications. 
Just you give the HN Sharma, you will get the publication. It is available. Recently, it is published, 2021-2022, in Taylor and Francis and other publications. So you can get the name of the plants. Easily, you will get it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Aryan. Beautiful presentation and your lecture, your knowledge you have dispersed to the minds of our, all these researchers here. And I'm sure uh, your uh, talk has induced many more questions and as you have opened new avenues where we could go for further research. And he has very op given open-ended questions to us so that we can explore. Thank you very much, sir. Now, uh, before uh, uh, finishing this, uh, I invite uh, Kadam sir to felicitate Sharma sir, please. Thank you, Karan, sir. Now we have the next lecture from Dr. Ben Benjakul Sutwat from Faculty of Agro-Industry, uh, Prince Agotkala University, Thailand. Uh, before uh, starting his lecture, I request uh, Kamre, sir, to introduce him. Kamre. Good morning, everyone. It is our privilege to have an uh, eminent scientist from Thailand who has remarkable world ranking. He is engaged in research, research of excellence, as his center also named after International Center for Excellence in Seafood Sciences and Innovation. He has received several awards. He has been working as a reviewer for several reputed journals. He has more than 1,000 publications to his credit. He has remarkable funding. He is continuously engaged in research and motivating others to go for excellence in sciences. I would like to invite Dr. Benjakul for his talk. Sir, are you there? Yes. Yeah. So uh, can... Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, sir. You can... Uh, Share your I can screen. share screen. Can I share screen? Yes, sir. You are a co-host. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
thank you so much for kind introduction. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here to give a talk. So, my talk today is the better expectation of fish viscera and skin with emphasis on the proteases and hydrolyzed collagen with bioactivities. Uh, actually, I'm from uh, Prince of Songkhla University in Thailand. And uh, we have five campuses, and I come from here, the main campus, Hajai campus. Same. Sorry for technical problem. Uh, no, sir, you are live. Okay, now, now you can, can you see my slide? Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Slides are visible. It's okay. All right, so I can continue, okay. All right, so I'm going to start my, my talk. So actually my talk today have two parts. The first part, recovery of fish enzyme and applications. And uh, fish and fish products is very important income generator for Thailand, also India for many decades. And uh, one of the most important steps is uh, butchering or evisceration in which a viscera are generated. And of course, those viscera can be an excellent source for proteases, which can hydrolyze peptide bond. And we end up with a peptide or free amino acid and when we can uh, classify proteolytic enzyme, we can classify as a more action like uh, endopeptidase or isopeptidase. So for endopeptidase, it's randomly cleaved inside the peptide chain, while the exopeptidase is cleaved from the N-terminal or C-terminal. And when we uh, classify based on catalytic size, it's classified based on like a uh, serine proteases, cysteine proteases, asthmatic proteases, and meteoroproteases. And you can see from here, uh, when we talk about endopeptidase, um, the enzyme can cleave the peptide randomly inside the chain, so that's why you, we end up with the several kind of peptide. Why? On the other hand, the exopeptidase can cleave from the N-terminal or C-terminal, so you can see we have the small fragment, but the, we still have the large protein molecule there. All right, so uh, we have the screen uh, uh, tri trypsin from the different organ from tuna, because tuna is a big industry in Thailand, we export a lot of the canned tuna to many uh, countries over the world. And that uh, organ, those organs include spleen, liver, pan pancreas, and stomach. And the stomach can be source of pepsin, while the hepatopancreas, spleen, parasigar can be source of trypsin and chromatypsin. And uh, in Thailand, in our study also, we use a skipjack tuna. Among all tuna, skipjack tuna is na, a number one in terms of amount that we use for processing. And we also have bluefin tuna, abaco tuna, yellowfin tuna. And this is a stomach of the tuna. And also we study the stomach from other species. And actually they ha, uh, the pepsin have been studied for a long time ago, like uh, you know, pepsin from uh, electric cord, uh, pepsin from golden um, mandarin fish, for example. And uh, pepsin is aspartic protease in which the aspartic acid involved in catalytic threat. And we also purify the pepsin from the abaco tuna using series of chromato chromatographies, including gel, uh, gel filtration, ionic exchangers, for example. So you can see from this uh, table, and we end up with a very low yield, but we have the high purification fold, like 658. Uh, fold. And when we take a look from the uh, molecular weight, and this land represents the uh, pepsinogen or proenzyme. We have molecular weight around 39.9 kilodalton, while the active pepsin have molecular weight around 32.7. And this is a um, native page for the pepsin. And also this one is simogram. We use hemoglobin as substrate. And the clear band here indicating the presence of pepsin here. And we also study the activation of the uh, pepsinogen to active pepsin. 
So we found that pepsinogen was converted to be active pepsin by a two-step process through an intermediate form because pseudo uh, pepsin, you can see from here. You see, this is a uh, pepsinogen and this are intermediate. And after five minutes, those of pepsinogen convert to be active pepsin. Here, you can see it here, up to the 30 minutes. And this is a cartoon that represents that basically the pepsinogen or some cymogen, uh, you know, uh, this uh, segment have, must be removed, okay? And this is be become active pepsin. And pepsin can hydrolyze the protein, a food protein like a uh, muscle from milk from uh, uh, other sources to peptide. And when we study sorokine inhibitors, and we found that the pep study in A, which is specific for aspect for this, show the high inhibitory activities at 0.1, and we cannot detect activity when the high concentration was used. However, E64, which is specific for his in proteases. Excuse me, sir. Screen is not changing, sir. Uh, screen is not changing. How come? Okay, wait, wait. Okay, can you see here right now? Okay, yeah. Okay, among all the inhibitors, we found that the pepsidin A uh, showed the high inhibitory activities and also the high level, they can, we cannot detect the activity as well. For ECD4, which is specific for system proteas, we uh, we can uh, it cannot inhibit the uh, pepsin EDDA, which is specific for metal OPDS, also cannot inhibit the activities. And so, I'll be interested in inhibitor, which is specific for serine proteas, also cannot inhibit uh, activities. And also, ATP molybdate, sodium chloride, uh, calcium chloride have no inhibitory activity over the pepsin, but SDS uh, completely inhibit the activities. Oops. And this is a, a structure for pepsidin A, which is an inhibitor for pepsin, right? And this is also the uh, pH profile and temperature profile. Uh, we found that the pepsin have the highest activities at the pH 2 and lowest activity at neutral pH. And also they have the uh, optimum um, te uh, temperature at 50 degrees Celsius with increasing the temperature the loss in activity was found. That is because the thermal denaturation of uh, pepsin, which is protein. And we also uh, use a pepsin from other sources like a big eye snapper stomach, and we use as the aid of, for collagen extraction. So I'm gonna explain you what's happened when why we have to use pepsin for increase the, uh, for, uh, for, for collagen extraction. Basically, you know, we, you, we, come, we start from fibril, which consists of the tropocollagen, who uh, connect each other at the pteropeptide region like this. You know that the uh, collagen it, uh, consists of triple helix structure like this. And once, uh, but however, pepsin cleaves basically at this region only. And once this kind of like a, uh, region was cleaved, make it the tropomyosin, uh, sorry, pteropeptide uh, can uh, reach out easily with the acid and we end up with the pepsin superpeptide. And the one that uh, extract only the acid, we call acid superpeptide AAC. So normally AS, AAC have the very low yield that we compare with the PSC. Let's see from this one, okay? You can see that when we use the uh, acid, acetic acid at 48 hours, we have the yield around 5.3. But when we use the pepsin for 48 hours, we uh -huh. can increase the yield by three times. And we, we use two process. I mean, start from the acid extraction for 24 hours, followed by the use of pepsin for 20, 48 hours. We can increase the, the yield almost 20%. Uh, percent. And we also compare with the positive pepsin, which are available in market. We found that for two process, we found that the much lower yield when compared with the big eye sample pepsin. So from this one, we, we can conclude that, you know, when we use the uh, big eye sample pepsin uh, to uh, extract the, uh, PSC, we can come up with a higher yield. And we take a look from the uh, thermal stability of the, pep, the, the collagen. And we found that they have similar uh, Tmax when we uh, determine by DSC. But for enthalpy, we found that the last one have the high, higher 
uh, enthalpy when compared with the other. However, in general, the Tmax is similar. So it means that they have the similar thermal property. And we take a look from the uh, SDS page or protein pattern. Uh, you can see from non-reducing uh, condition and reducing condition, we found that for the same the sample like uh, acid A48 uh, and A48, or the same pattern, what found. So what is mean by this is mean that the collagen doesn't contain the desulfide bond. And this is agreement with the no cysteine was detected in the collagen. But when we take a look here, for B, when we use pepsin, you can see that the um, beta chain, which is dimer, is a larger in, 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 in quantity. That is mean that the pepsin may help to just extract beta chain from the skin. So that's why they end up with a higher yield. And also the when we use the two processes, similar result was found in which the higher um, amount of the beta chain can be extracted. And we take a look from the uh, amino acid composition. We found that glycine constitutes around one third of the total amino acid. And also uh, they, we found amino acid, which is uh, represent proline and oxyproline. So this is from the uh, feather back uh, skin. And uh, also then other species, we also found that the same thing is mean that glycine uh, have a uh, content in the collagen around one third. And also they contain the amino acid around 198 to 199 residue per 1000 residue. And this is also important data because uh, you know, uh, collagen normally is an acid soluble. And you can see from here that ASC have the optimum, uh, the pH for solubility at two, why the PSC have the optimum uh, solubility at the pH three. However, they lose uh, the solubility at around neutral pH. So some company in Thailand, they also fortify the native collagen in the acidic fruit juice, like uh, you know, pomegranate, like this. Why? That because the uh, trypsin, uh, sorry, uh, because the collagen can sol soluble in the drink and they can fortify it with yeast. However, if you want to fortify in milk, it's impossible because the or the collagen will be precipitated. All right. Apart from the fortification, they are, uh, for native collagen, they normally use it for tissue engineering, actually for scaffold. And the scaffold is a kind of like uh, the place for uh, the acid the cell to form the desired tissue. And this is a, like a, you know, a scaffold produced from collagen. And this is a PD cells. It means the cell that, that the located membrane covering the outer surface of the bone. And the arrow sign is indicated cell that can proliferate it on the, uh, on the scaffold. Okay. All right, I'm going to move to trypsin when after we talk about the pepsin. So trypsin, uh, we can produce from the fish and shellfish, you know, and uh, trypsin is belong to serine proteases. And normally the pepsin, they prefer to hydrolyze the, uh, that carboxyl group of lysine and arginine. So as a consequence, the peptide produced gonna have the lysine and arginine as C terminal. This is like uh, the, the, the observation, okay? And how to uh, measure the activity of trypsin? So basically we can use the sub, uh, synthetic substrate like uh, babna. So these are vitamin amide activity. So the uh, enzyme gonna clip the amide bond here and release a product, paranitroalanine, which we can monitor by a spectrophotometer at 410 nanometers. And also we can um, use a TAME, which is uh, determine esterase activity. So it's not gonna clip at ester one here and uh, end up with the uh, pepto, uh, sorry, for, uh, products, uh, tocil l arginine which can monitor at uh, only at the two, uh, so four, seven nanometers. So uh, from screening, we found that the screen is the, uh, contain the larger, largest amount of the trypsin from tuna. So what you can see from here, when we compare the screen from the skipjack tuna, yellowfin tuna, tonko tuna, the yellowfin tuna have the highest protease activity, which we can see from here. This is we test for using casein as substrate at PS9 at uh, 55 degrees Celsius, and we found this one. Right, and we use a, a simogram or a standing, and you can see A is a, like a skipjack tuna, a B yellowfin tuna, C tongo. You can see the form pattern. The clear clear band is represent the uh, trypsin. So you can see that each uh, fish they're gonna have different uh, isoform of proteases. 
thing. And when we purify the uh, trypsin from skipjack tuna sprain, we found uh, three isoforms, which have the same error rate around 24 uh, kilodaltons. But when we uh, determine using native page, you can see the position of the band is different. So it means that they're going to have the different PI, which is reflect that they have the different I mean, it's sequences. Also, apart from the, the fish, we can use, uh, we can extract the trypsin from the heptapancreas uh, of the uh, crustacean like a, a prawn or shrimp. So this is a sample for heptapancreas from the freshwater prawn. Okay, and we purify using the q sephiroid ion exchange together with superdex uh, 75 columns. And, you, uh, and we purify until you get the homogeneity. And we found that the trypsin from the, the, the prawn have the quite low molecular weight around 17 when compared with the fish like the 24, right? I mentioned previously, and this is a very quite small one. And also it confirmed by simogram. And we've also found that this also can have like casein, right? And we also do like a intermediate sequencing. And we found that they have a high homology for uh, some uh, segment when you compare with other trypsin from other sources, but it's observed that some segment here, you can see this one in the box, is to have the homology with the black tiger prawn. That because maybe they from the some uh, from like a same same genus or, or like it's the same position. And the trypsin from heterobenchris can hydrolyze collagen. You can see this uh, alpha chain and as a function of time up to 15 minutes, is a uh, alpha chain was degraded. Um, to the high, much higher extent with the function of time. And also this is another a collagen from the, the other shrimp. So as a similar result, when the time uh, increased, those kind of band was decreased to the higher extent. All right, this is a um, have to be increased from the, the real industry. That because, you know, we, uh, the, some products, they produce the whole shrimp without heptobin increase, or we call the whole shrimp a uh, free, uh, heptopin get free whole shrimp. So they have the sucking machine suck out of this one. You can see this is a sample of heptopin crest. And it's just a uh, simple to uh, extract. So firstly, we have to remove the, the fat using acetone at the low temperature and homogenize it. And then we just dry it at the room temperature. And then we end up with the crude isotone powder, which is free of the fat. And then we extract and uh, fractionation ammonium sulfate at 40 to 60 uh, percent saturation. And we come up with this fraction. And we use this fraction to hydrolyze the, um, the collagen from the sea bass skin. This is the sea bass skin and we cut into small pieces and swollen using acetic acid, right? And then we compare with alkalase, this is our enzyme, and we hydrolyze at the APH8 at uh, 60 degrees Celsius. And we hydrolyze until uh, we come up with a hydrolyte collagen like this, okay? And when we compare between the two enzymes, this our enzyme at the top one, and this alkalase at 10 uh, units per gram, you can see that they, uh, our enzyme have uh, provide a higher DH to represent degree of hydrolysis one here, right? And also at five units per gram, our enzyme also have the higher DH than alkalase. So it's mean that our enzyme have the uh, higher activity in cleavage of the uh, collagen in the fish skin. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna move to the uh, the second uh, part. I mean, hydrolyzed collagen from fish skin with emphasis on the process development and bioactivities. And actually fish fillet or slices is a very popular, uh, it's very innovation country like a steak. And during processing, they have the uh, some product like scale, skin, even bone. Those can be used as a source of the collagen and, and gelatin. So when we talk about fillet, we can use a, a knife manually or use machine. However, we come up with this one, a skin. So what we can do for with this skin, actually they can uh, sell as the animal feed, but some of them they use as a uh, deep fried snack like this. Actually, like Um, snack coated with the salted egg yolk, actually the delicious one, but quite expensive though. Um, okay, so now that we talk, we already talked about collagen, right? And now if we denature it, it become gelatin, and if we hydrolyze it, we come up with peptide or hydrolyzed collagens. 
Okay, so I am going to focus on this one. In our in my talk today, we talk of, from two fish. The first one is sea bass, Asian sea bass, and the other one unicorn leather jacket. So we produce hydrolyzed collagen from the skin of from both species. Okay, so a global fish a collagen peptide market was estimated at the 271 million US dollar in 2020. Industry is a further uh, expect to grow by 8.2% during the period of 2021 to 2026 here. And one of the main driving force in the global market is uh, people health awareness. Let me take a look from this slide. The market can be divided based on application as shown in this slide. The last segment, the purple one, is uh, given for bone and joint health care, especially for the elderly who face some problem like a joy pain or osteoporosis. And also they use for nutraceuticals and also for um, pharmaceutical, okay? And also cosmetic surgical. So the hydrolyzed collagen of collagen peptide is very, can become popular so far. And what, have, what is a hydrolyzed collagen? So let me start from matter collagen here. After we denature it, it's got to split alpha chain together. And when we add the enzyme, it's are gonna cleave those kind of far chain to be chain peptide with the molecular around 0 0.3 to 8 uh, kilodalton. And hydrolyzed collagen is highly digestible and is easily absorbed because of the smaller size. Okay. And this is a way to produ produce this in our lab. You know, we, we, we can use a, a small scale or we use a, like a reactor, like this is the uh, 300 uh, lit liters reactors. And this is a uh, hydrolyzed collagen. And basically in the market, the hydrolyzed collagen from, produced from ozine. Ozine is demerol scale here, like this from ozine. And we mostly import it from abroad. And, and how about the fish skin? Can we produce the hydrolyzed collagen from skin? So what we have to consider when we, the, we use the skin as a raw material for production of hydrolyzed collagen, first thing we have to consider about fat is in the fish skin and also the fishy order of the resulting hydrolysate or hydrolyzed collagen. You can take a look from here. This is a, like a, 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 the, the pictures representing the fat distributed throughout their skin. We dye the fat using the NIBUA and this is a red spot represent the uh, fat. You can see that there are a lot of fat uh, distributed throughout the, uh, the skin. All right, and also when we extract the oil, uh, the fat, uh, the oil or fat from the skin, we found that they're rich in the PUFA, especially for EPA and DHA, uh, and also um, totally the PUFA or polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, constitute around forty-one point five percent. So it's so what happens is those kind of PUFA is uh, once it's gonna become radicals induced by uh, anything like UV light or anything like this. This radical in the present ocean is going to become the corrosive radical and become hydroperoxide. And hydroperoxide is not stable and decomposed to a uh, secondary ocean product like aldehyde ketone, which causes the fishy odor. Right? So, how to improve the? Uh, so, the stretch, uh, strategy is to we have to remove the fat as much as possible. So, we have developed the process for defecting of the fish skin using polyurethane fuel uh, based on electroporation together with light paste and also vacuum impregnations. So this is a vessel that we use to put the, our sample. I'll take a look from here. So this is solution, light paste solution. The pieces is represent the uh, a peripherate skin subject to PF. So PF is make the pore small pore in the skin like this. And when we vacuum, vacuum, apply vacuum, those air is got come out from the, 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 the hole of the skin. And when we release or restore, the, the uh, vacuum, those light paste uh, solution gonna get through the, the pore and light paste can hydrolyze the fat effectively. So in this process, you know, we, uh, we use the four cycles and one cycle process uh, include the vacuum for 20 minutes followed by uh, retrospiration for 10 minutes and total operation time with 135 minutes and see the result. This is a control skin with a lot of fat but after we treated with our life, uh, method, we found that the fat is um, drastically removed. And also we uh, determine the volatile compounds 
and in uh, in, in the resulting hydrolysate, you know, this is a hydrolysate produced from the skin of BPP pair using lipase or the method I, I just mentioned. You can see aldehyde is uh, like a much lower than the control one without doing any, anything. Okay, and uh, we cannot detect uh, ketone here. We have just only like a, a benzyl alcohol here for alcohol. If you run, it's just a small amount. However, we also have the con under control using isopropanol, and we operate the same thing without lipase, but we use isopropanol instead. You can see that we still have a lot of aldehyde here, also a lot of ketone, and also alcohol, and also furan. So these are result indicating clearly that uh, when when after we remove the fat uh, to the large extent, we can produce the um, hydrolyzed collagen with a small uh, volatile compound. All right, so we can see the, the process used also affect the bioactivity of hydrolyzed collagen. So firstly, we produce a, a hydrolyzed collagen, which of course we start from pretreatment. One of them is defecting, as I mentioned, and select the hydrolysis process. What kinds are you use? You know, the time for hydrolysis, and also we end up with the hydrolyzed collagens. Okay, so this example that I'm gonna talk. So uh, we have the four processes. The first one we use alkylase of uh, 0.2 unit per gram for 1.5 hours. This alkylase 0.3 unit per gram for, for 1.5 hours. This one you will use after enzyme papain, 0.6 unit per gram for 1.5 hours. And these two enzymes together, first start from papain at 0.3 unit per uh, gram for 1.5, followed by alkylate at 0.2 unit uh, for 1.5 hours. And this one also similar thing, but different in term unit, okay? So it's a combined uh, uh, enzyme. And we monitor uh, antioxidant activities using different assays. And you can see from here for ABTS radical scavenging activities, that these, these products, this process provide the highest activities. Also for DPS radical, they also show the highest activities. And also this one also show the highest activity being compared with the um, other sample. However, they show the lower FAP, FRAP, you know, when compared with ascorbic, which you use a control one. But for metal chelating activities, they have a slightly lower activity than this uh, process one. So in general, uh, the process used determine the activities of the uh, hydrolyzate or hydrolyzed collagens. All right, so we select the best one and we found that uh, the, we study side distribution and we found that the major peptide have the around uh, 888 and also 1,108 Daltons. We use uh, uh, LCM SMS. And this is uh, like a analysis composition of hydrolyzed collagens. And again, glycine also comes to around one third, which is like a major uh, um, uh, amino acid. That's because it's come from mother collagen. Okay, so that might no doubt that they have the one third uh, uh, proportion. And we we also, this red label is represent the hydrophobic amino acid. So this hydrophobic was assumed that to contribute to the high anti accident activity of hydrolyzed collagens. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look from bioactivity of the hydrolyzed collagens. So the first one, prevention of DNA damages. So now we, we use the uh, hydrolysate from the unique like, leather jacket skin. So we also identify some uh, peptide we found uh, because we use a uh, glycyl endovipidase from Pavia latex. So what do you mean by uh, glycyl endovipidase? So okay, they prefer to hydrolyze glycine at the, uh, from C uh, carboxy group. So the product, you can see that C terminal, they have glycine, glycine, glycine for all the thing. And also every third position they have glycine. This is because the alpha chain, they contain, uh, contain the glycine every third position. That's the, the reason behind, okay? So if we use LCMS, MS for uh, identification of pept peptide. And when we take a look from here, when we use the oxidant, we use, in this case, we use hydrogen peroxide at 40 micromolar and 60 micromolar. And we found that this are dark bar represent the DNA damages. Control one is kind of negligible damages, but, but when you use the high level of uh, hydrogen peroxide, you can see that the high level of the DNA was damaged. And once we add uh, uh, those hydrolyzed collagens, you can see that the DNA damage is uh, reduced in the dose dependent manners. Okay, so from the, the, this experiment, we found that hydrolyzed collagen or peptide can reduce those cardiac damage in the dose dependent manners. 
All right, so one more thing that interesting is like skin nourishment. So uh, actually when we get older, you know, we, the people get wrinkled like this, you know, and like this on the first forehead. So uh, that's because, you know, in the younger skin, we have that the, uh, a large amount of dense uh, collagens in the dermis. And also it, when we get older, those collagen is kind of like a weaker and also maybe hydrolyzed by metalloporteases and they kind of like make this, this kind of wrinkle occur. Okay, so this is a experiment, not our group, for, but, but interesting because we did not uh, conduct an animal trial. So they have their white uh, four week or, or male white star rat and they fed with the different um, feed. So this one, the control and feed, and this one uh, add the 12% casein, sodium casein, and this one add the 12% hydride collagens. Okay, and after four weeks, they sacrifice uh, the rat were sacrificed and then the skin was take out and the extract for protein and do even the broad thing or Western broad uh, for, uh, toward the Thai 1 collagen and Thai 4 collagen. And you can see from here that the, the rat, the fed that with the diet containing the hydro collagen have the higher Thai 1 collagen and Thai 4 collagens when compared with control and also the one that added with the uh, casein. What happens is here, so why we, we have to pay attention for Thai 1 and Thai 4? So Thai 1 is normally is, the, uh, is a major component in the mist, and Thai 4 is a major component in the, be the basement of the skin. So one area this collapse of this one, they also make a wrinkle. And also they found that uh, the, the, the group that fed it with the diet containing hydrate collagen, they have the lower metalloporteous as, as indicated by lower band from simogram here. You compare with, you see control have the larger band, it's been high activity of metalloporteous, but this one have the lower uh, activities. So, a collagen hydrolysate can increase expression of collagen type 1, type 4, and inhibit metal, metal proteas. And uh, I'm going to come up uh, with some, some uh, um, uh, idea from this one is dual action mechanism of hydrolyzed collagen. So the first one is free amino acid become the uh, building block for formation of collagen elastic fibers. And collagen oligopeptide act as ligands binding to receptor on the fibroblast membrane and stimulate the production of new collagen or elastin, okay? So one of our experiments, we use hydrolyzed collagens from sea bass skin together with vitamin C or ascorbic acid. You can see from here that when we use the uh, hydrolyzed collagen to, uh, together with uh, vitamin C at two to one ratio, and when we uh, need to mean the proliferation of the fibroblast cell with a skin cell, we found that the highest activities found in, in here when compared with vitamin C only or uh, hydrolyzed collagen only. And also, uh, we found that the collagen was produced much more uh, when we add the, uh, when we use hydrogen uh, collagen together with vitamin C at two one to one ratio. Here you can see from from here they come they higher than other sample. And this know now that in the market right now you can see the hydrogen plus vitamin C and collagen plus uh, what plus C something like this. So this is because uh, they uh, work synergistically to proliferate the fibroblast cell and in which they can promote the production of collagen is for skin. All right, so we're gonna move to wound healing. So wound healing is also like a, a how the hyaluronic collagen can improve or uh, heal the, the, the wound. So firstly, we see that the, the fibroblast cells, you know, and then we make a scratch by using the serial tip here. You can see the, 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 the scratch here, it represents the wound. After that, we put the hydrolyzed collagen at different concentration, like a 125 microliter, microgram per milliliter up to 500 microgram to milliliters. And after 24 hours, uh, we also determined the, uh, the gap wound and we found that the gap wound also become smaller with a uh, level at two, uh, twin, uh, 250 and 500 microgram per milliliters. And also the fibroblast cell also uh, have the high proliferation when we add more um, hydrolyzed collagen, it's really at 250 and 50, uh, 500 microgram per milliliter. And we, one more thing that we can uh, use to indicate the wound healing is mean that uh, laminopodia formation. So laminopodia is kind of something is crawling, uh, the cell crawling, uh, because uh, it's kind of branch uh, acting filament used for cell migration. So when we uh, determine the, those kind of laminopodia, we found that laminopodia is increased uh, in the one that, uh, treated with the hydrolyzed collagen at uh, 250 and 500 microgram per milliliters. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about osteogenesis. 
about about the bone. All right, so this is a World Health Organization has defined osteoporosis as a decrease in the best bone by 50% and bone, uh, bone equal, uh, qualities by 50%. And actually one in three women and one in five men over 50 years old will experience osteoporosis fracture. So you, it is painful, okay? And before that, we also like a study the cytotoxicity. We use a pre osteoporosis blood cell in this study, and we uh, study on toxicity and which uh, level that we can study. We found that we can use high red collagen up to 800 microgram per milliliter for study. And pre osteoporosis blood cell is a precursor for mature osteoporosis blood cell. In this study, we uh, we study on using the hydrolyte collagen at different level, 50, 100, 200 microgram per milliliter, and we monitor um, alkali phosphatase. So alkali phosphatase is an early osteogenic markers of bone formation and bone calcification. It is uh, secreted by osteoblasts to provide phosphate for bone mineralization. So you can see from the data here, only the uh, first seven years that we found that the hydrolyte collagen at 100, microgram per milliliter have the highest, but when later state, I mean, uh, 14 day, 21 day, they don't have big difference, okay? So it's uh, important only the, the early stage. And this is also the important data indicating about the role of the hydrolyte collagens, okay? On, on the, uh, the bone uh, calcification. And we also do the same thing for, uh, we monitor at seven day, 14 day, 21 day, and this control one, 50, 100, 200 microgram per milliliter. And we also uh, 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 stain using alisalinate S to staining calcium deposition. So that is the dark spot here representing calcium. And we also monitor those guys kind of like uh, the, the, uh, the amount or quantity of the calcium form. And we found that the highest formation we found with the addition of the 100 and 200 microgram per milliliter here. So this result uh, confirmed that the hydrolyte collagen also uh, uh, helped to just like uh, strengthen the bone, right? So I want, would like to end up with my summary. The fish uh, viscera can be exploited as the source of proteases, which can be used as processing it in hydrolysis instead of commercial proteases. And also fish skin, a byproduct from fish processing should be fully utilized to increase the revenue for processor like hydrolyte collagen with high demand in the market right now. And new value added products, particularly nutraceuticals and cosmeceuticals with higher market value might be further uh, produced and developed and thus enhancing expectation and of the uh, fish skin and gain benefit for their um, farmers, processor and other, and also consumer. So thank you so much for kind attention. Thank you. Wait. Stop sharing. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a nice lecture. Shall we have one or two quick questions? If not, uh, I have some announcement. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of Swami Ramantirth Marathwada University, School of uh, Life Sciences, uh, International Conference of uh, Advances in Bi Bioactive Molecules, we wish to congratulate uh, Dr. Benjikul for receiving the Royal Medal, the highest award, Dushida Mala, by the auspicious hands of the, the King uh, Ramatan for his uh, contribution to the agriculture. So a loud applause for him. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, let's break for a high tea and within 15 minutes, we'll be back and we will continue with the lectures. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.
अरे बटन की तो वॉइस पर मैं बोल रहा था ये करना है था इधर पर सुनो ना ये ये
Good morning, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Very good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, okay. In the series of talks, I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Girinath G. Pillai, is a PhD, PhD from Florida University. He is working as a chief senior scientist in Signature Discovery UK, associated with MHRD's Drug Hackathon 2020. He's engaged. In research, questions, Mercury Research Fellow, good number of publications, patent, co authored book also. But when I come across with Dr. Girinath, I could say that he is more, more and more interested in interacting with the students to make them understand how a drug behaves, how a drug works. He has been doing wonders with the softwares that he is using as his global projects. They represent ExxonMobil, USDA, Johnson & Johnson, S1 US, correctly. His focus in the area of aging and AI based drug discovery. Now, apart from the scientific positions he holds, he is a mentor in IIT, Coatum. Then he is an active partner in government's Niti Ayog. He is a research advisor to Pondicherry <laughs> University, IIT, and other institutions across the India. So let us start a journey of drugs and their interactions. Dr. continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I hope uh, uh, my audio is clear. Let me share my screen. And yes, oh. sir, it is. The host has to give me permissions to share the screen. Yeah, I have no permissions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I hope my screen is visible now. Yes, sir. It is. Great. Thank you so much. Great. So if you don't hear me in between, please let me know. Sure, sir. Okay. So uh, good morning, uh, one and all. Um, yeah, it is around 7.20 uh, a.m. here at Nottingham, UK. I recently moved to UK. I was in Bangalore. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Complacer, as well as the organizers of this particular conference. Uh, I'm really, uh, it's my uh, privilege as, and also a pleasure to be part of this um, event. And uh, thanks uh, for the great opportunity too. I'm not uh, sure because a lot of offline uh, audiences also there I can see on the video. I'm happy to see that. And uh, well, what is your background and all? So just I'm giving an overview on what you have to take care uh, when you're doing drug discovery. Let be you're a biologist. Let be you're a chemist, toxicologist, pharmacologist, pharmaceutical chemist, medicinal chemist, organic chemist, biophysicist, biotechnologist, biochemist, 
or bioinformaticians. Until and unless all of them join hands together, drug discovery is very much incomplete. So don't think that just using computers, you can bring up a drug. Never, ever. And don't think that a chemist alone can come up with a drug. Again, not possible. So this is where I, I want to just give an insight with a short span of time. I know it's only 30 minutes for me. So let me quickly go through that. So today I'm, I'm trying to cover uh, with a little bit of a mix of chemistry and biology, including how the target identification, how or what specifics we have to consider when we are going for drugs. That's where we have to still remember the notes from Martha, who was ahead at GSK back in 2009, a grand challenge for all of us is to how to best incorporate the existing knowledge. And that's how what we do, actually. We always refer to the current or previous published papers and then try to take some insights, adapt some new techniques, new methodologies, new protocols. But then we also think, have to think out of the box what else we can do. And that's where the innovation comes in. That's where the nobility comes. Repeating the same protocol with a different disease doesn't make much sense because every different problem has to be looked at a different perspectives and all problems are not same. All problems having a solution, only thing you have to think in a different perspectives. When you're looking at the history of medicinal chemistry, it's all um, with the synthesis of urea in 1828 started with organic medicinal chemistry. Without medicinal chemistry, there is no drug discovery. There is no drug at all. Now you might think, oh, there are natural extracts, herbal products. It has its own limitations and formulation, mixture and crude criteria and all. Characterization is a bit challenged there when it comes as a mixture. So medicinal chemistry received a formal recognition in academic pharmacy in 1932. If you look at the history, especially on Indian medicinal chemistry, as you can see, it all started from the plant parts and animal products to prepare medicines. Neem, tulsi, aloe vera, honey, and still we continue using them. And that's where Charagan is known to be the father of ancient medicinal chemistry, where he has been uh, written books called Charaga Samhita and the first book in medication in third and the fourth century. And then Bodhidharman and then Shushrutan. And that's where we have this Ayurvedam, herbal medicines and all. Ashtangaridam is that's where Ayurvedam got evolved. These all are known to be holistic medicines or traditional medicines. Still, we do not know the mechanism of action. Sometimes we do not know mode of action, but it works some way or the other. And it has its own pharmacokinetic challenges too, which we are already aware of it. Even the normal medicines also have its own side effects. So this is where we have wanted to evolve things, how we can overcome these challenges. That's where the rise of modern medicine came. I'm not saying that modern medicine is the best, but yeah, it, it has all its merits and demerits everywhere. But when you're looking at the, how it evolved in 1857, eminent French scientist Louis Pasteur confirmed the Schwann's fermentation experiments, supported the hypothesis that yeast were microorganisms. <laughs> and that's where with the 21st century, with a big pharma picture, where every year US FDA approving certain new chemical or new molecular entities that's being approved for specific diseases. Now you see few numbers in double digits like 21, 27, 41, 15, but the applications went for them a hundreds, maybe 100 or 200, or maybe few, few uh, tens. But then why there is not many of them are getting approved? That's because of the failures in the class. I mean, when they go for the clinical trials, either in phase two or in phase four, majorly. Now, this is where we have to tackle and understand how things has to be. Uh, we have to work out in the basic research area itself, which you guys in the audience can do it. All the drug uh, drugs that has come to the market, most of them, majority of them, 
came from an academic research group. The question is, if it, is it from India? I really don't know. Most of them are from US, Europe, Australia, Germany and all. So if there is something from India, please let me know. I know there are many uh, new, um, nutraceuticals and all those things are there from India, but something on USFDA, I'm not sure. But yeah, we do have uh, topical medicines like lotions and uh, some gels and all stuff came out from CSAR, which I'm aware of. So this is where we have to think big and see how this has to be tackled. Now, I, I can see many of the biologists are here. When you do some biological assays with certain compounds, let's say for biological activity studies, uh, generally you might come up with three compounds or five compounds. But you can see here, when the clinical trial started at phase one or maybe preclinical studies, they go with 10 to 15 compounds. At that stage, very advanced drug development process stage, they went with 10 to 15 compounds for the hypothesis. But when we do a basic research, we still stand with two or three molecules. I know the reasons. It's because of fund limitations, time limitations, et cetera, et cetera, resource limitations. But that shouldn't be the case. We should have at least 50 molecules to do biological testing. And we should be pre-planned accordingly for budget allocation for that. Then only we see some success rate which progresses because as we progress in each stages, we filter compounds. And if you see here at each phases, you can see the compounds getting reduced. Okay. Initially, we can see 10 to 20 compounds. Now it reduced from five to 10 compounds and then two to five compounds. And finally, one to two compounds, which goes to the final phases. And then one compound gets approved and the research will be still ongoing where many thousands of research subjects being used for analyzing how this reacts, how this affects toxicity and many other factors. So when you're starting with your academic research, it's very important that you have enough data to pass on to a transfer of technology or knowledge to the pharma industry where they need to have a freedom to explore what is next they can do. When you look at the discovery phases, it starts with the drug discovery mainly on target identification. Uh, this is where it's very much investments are happening nowadays. It is still there, but not much focused. But nowadays, it's much more focused. This is where we need biochemists, biotechnologists, bioinformaticians, systems pharmacology, systems biology, network pharmacology, and all because we need to identify the right target for our disease causing agents. We need to find out what are the other interacting partners for our specific targets. Is there an off target or a multi target? All those things has to be analyzed. So target identification and validation is one of the key areas in a specific drug discovery project. It's not like as you see in previous papers, yeah, this is the PD, a PDB ID I chose from this particular paper they referenced. I picked up and I did my docket. Yeah, you need to have a reasoning. Why did you choose it? What is the functional site in it? Is there a catalytic site in an enzyme? Are you targeting the sub substrate bound site? Whether you are targeting apocyte or allosteric site, all those things biologically has to be defined. Now, if this is drug discovery is being done by a chemist, make sure you have some biology friends to discuss and help you with that, to collaborate. And then we go with the lead discovery and lead optimization where molecular docking, QSAR, many more other parameters can be done for screening purpose. And then comes with the drug development, with the preclinical test for ADME, toxicity, simulations, and clinical trials. Fortunately, most of them are being assisted with the computer-aided design. Note that terminology assisted. That means it is not a replacement for any of your wet lab experiments, but it is going to direct you. It's going to help you make decisions in your wet lab experiments. And that's again uh, a big question mark goes, why there is an increase in the cost of medicines? Not to blame government, not to blame regulatory bodies, not to blame market, that's all there. We cannot avoid them. But as a researcher, 
how can you reduce the cost of medicine is something a big question mark always been prevailing since many decades the main reason for failure was of the earlier, earlier uh, uh, oral drugs back in 1960s and 1980s was poor ADME properties, pharmacokinetic properties. Until unless the drug reaches your target safely, properly, promptly, on time, the action doesn't take place. So we need the drug to act and safely transport from administered path to the target. I'm making it, trying to make it very simple even there are uh, non-related uh, uh, audience uh, or students listening to this talk. Then efficacy. We talk about activity in one stage, but later we talk about effectiveness right, of the drug. And that's where we do in phase two. Most of the drug fails in phase two, even though we found it is active. So efficacy and ADME was the main reasons for the drug failures. Later, between 2000 and 2010, uh, most of the drug failures was because of poor toxicity or more toxicity and the poor strategy. Because since we have sophisticated tools, techniques, approaches, resources, we did mix and match and did not go well. And toxicity, we came up with several structures, several hypotheses, and ultimately we mainly focused on activity. Of course, we have to. But later, we gave a less importance to design based upon toxicity. And that also raised a big alarm. And because of these main reasons, the drugs started failing. And that's why we need to specify a learning system, which we technically call it as optimization. So we need to know exactly what knowledge is to be learned, how this knowledge is to be learned, and how this knowledge has to be represented. And that's where we call it as machine learning. So in data, it can be called as machine learning. In chemistry or in drugs, it can be called as lead optimization. Technically, both are doing the same thing. They are trying to learn automatically from one single run. And then they try to improve with the experience in the next time when they run. Similarly, I, I still remember my school exams I, I write exams, I performed very badly, and then I come to know, oh, oh, I didn't learn properly. Next time I have to learn better and improve my marks. The same way when you did a chemistry synthesis of a structure and you did animal testing and you found that uh, it's killing animals and it has some issues, then you did some analysis and understood, okay, this particular functional group or a particular analog has to be modified or optimized, and then I can get a better activity. And then I read it, read it the synthesis, and then did the activity studies where it might have improved. The same way machine learning, when you have some data, you would model it. And when you automatically learn what's the trend of the data, they try to improve with the existing data that we have. So keep in mind, whatever the research that you do in whatever field, you need to optimize them. On a single run, don't believe those data. Of course, it's a say. Um, you have to you have a cost for repeating your experiments but until unless you repeat your experiments you will not know the errors in your experiments when you look at the discovery phases the potential of new medicines it always starts with the basic research as i already mentioned what we all do in academia and then we go with the drug discovery and preclinical still academia can collaborate and go for ind submission patenting and transfer the technology to the pharma they can take it up for the further studies. But you need to give enough data for them to take that up. Not just publication, not just a single compound-based patent. They need more data, animal studies data, toxicity data, permeability data, bioavailability data. Of course, this is going to cost us. So, sorry for that repetition. So that's where we need to look at the objectives of the drug discovery. When you're looking at a common situation, the chemist will be going on synthesizing new compounds, generating more data, and also the computational biologist or modeler or chemist, they go, go on doing analysis and designing new molecules. But always these two guys fight each other. <laughs> Not fight, they have disagreements each other. For example, the chemist will always synthesize the compounds after the synthesis.
Hmm? Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, there was some issue with the network. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, host, can you please give me permission to share the screen? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm continuing. So. When, you're, when the computation modeler is going to design some structures and then he found that it has a good activity in the software, but then the chemist comes up with a concern saying that it's very difficult to synthesize. So uh, you have to come up with some of the structures. This is where I'm trying to mention that you have to form a consortium for any drug discovery project by any departments. Make sure you have the right expertise in the same team for the drug discovery project and they all plan, execute, initiate everything from the uh, initial ideation stage itself, even before the proposal. Then it goes well and good. But if just a chemist works alone, biologist works alone, computational works alone, doesn't make sense. So all have to go work together. And this is a better situation where all of them work together. They have much more insights and much more success rate. Now, the main objective of drug discovery is when you're considering three different terminologies in the drug compounds, that is heat, lead, and drug molecule. If it is uh, uh, being more live, I would have interacted a lot, but I am not sure how far that is possible right now. Usually at this stage, I used to ask a question, at what stage a chemical compound is called to be a drug molecule, right? Now, uh, it's, it's not the right uh, way, uh, medium or platform to do that right now. Anyway, I, I'll just go with this. So heat is a molecule when you have uh, thousands of molecules you analyzed or hundreds of molecules you looked at for potency or biological activity studies, and you found few hundreds of them could be a heat molecule. A single molecule cannot be a heat molecule. It could be few hundreds or few tens of them. And then among these heat molecules, whichever found to be safe, that is less toxic or non-toxic, which has a good bioavailability, that means absorption rate is good enough for the small intestine of human intestine. Metabolically stable, that means the compound passes through liver metabolism and many other metabolic pathways. We need to know that whether the compound never breaks down and forms a secondary metabolite. It's okay to form that, but you have, to pre, uh, you have a pre-knowledge that when the drug becomes active, even after forming a metabolite. And then the solubility and permeability of the compound is also very important. So when these heat molecules suffice a balance of all these properties, then we call them as a lead molecule. And once the IND submission or when this lead molecule gets into a clinical trial, and that's where we call it as a drug molecule. And when it comes to the market, we call it as a marketed drug molecule. Right? These are the different stages, actually. So until unless we have a balance of all these properties, we cannot call them as a lead molecule. But most of the papers, what we can see, they have reported only potency, only biological activity. That's enough for publication, maybe, but that's not enough for tomorrow's science. 
because expectations have increased a lot perspectives have changed a lot potency is not more any more going to de- make lot of decisions of course it's an important decision maker so quickly identify situations when a balance of all these properties are not possible that's where the industry mantra comes like fail fast fail cheap if you are early diagnosing this compound is not going to work or identifying them and you are stopping it and working on something else you are saving your money only when confident move with a certain compounds and try to avoid missed opportunities the biggest mistakes that we do in screening process of drugs in any field is that we might tend to end up with losing or missing the right compounds we might be working on something else which could be which we thought it is right but actually might not be right so avoid missed opportunity is something very important in pharma industry too i'm getting some pop ups okay that's where we need to i have to come up with another example at this point let's imagine i have compound a and compound b compound a is very active compound b is moderately active compound a even though it's very active at lower concentration it is also very toxic compound b at higher or lower concentration it's moderately active and no toxicity so generally i ask people which compound do you start with to do drug discovery a or b majority of them say b and i ask them why they said no toxicity so it's safe to start but that's not the right strategy our most biggest preference given in drug discovery is that activity when this is more activity with the less concentration then we try to see that and see how we can reduce the toxicity in that compound without affecting the activity if we fail in that approach or that particular strategy then only we go with b in order to improve the activity so when you make changes in the structures either increasing activity or lowering toxicity either way it affects when you lowering activity uh, sorry toxicity it might also affect activity we don't know and that's what we call it as the optimization strategy and that's whole thing comes into drug discovery of course less uh, arena on a biologist mostly for computational biologist computational chemist and modelers by the way it's uh, already uh, it's going to be around uh, 30 minutes but i just wanted to know is there any time left for me uh kamle sir yes sir you can please proceed so how many more minutes sir uh maybe 5 or 10 okay thank you Ten yeah, that's it. fine i got it thank you that's enough so in order to do this how do we come how how do we understand which part of the molecule is actually responsible for the toxicity or which part of the molecule is actually responsible for the activity and that's where we try to come up with sar structure activity relationship the structure comes from chemistry activity comes from biology and we try to correlate them with statistics or machine learning it has its own purpose for based upon reach endpoints or oecd principles and then we try to correlate them we try try to take the structure its biological activity data and then we try to correlate using statistical or machine learning models the accuracy is very important and this is where i i remember uh, in during our school uh, schooling we used to do titration experiment uh, i think i repeated the experiment six times because i made mistakes and that's exactly what we have to understand in experiment in wet lab experiments we have to repeat or iterate our experiments in order to know the error or the deviation in wet lab experiments when we have error why don't we have an error reporting from our computational studies 100% we should know the standard deviation because it's a prediction all software related uh, uh, they are subject to its to predictions so we need to know what could be the possible errors and this is what we are missing in many of the predictions we really don't know what is error value so you have to assess the predictive ability whether this is actually true or not 
for students actually i want to say this example in calculator 1 plus 1 is always 2 only it will never change but in biology in drug discovery 1 plus 1 has three different answers mainly 1.9 plus or minus 0.1 2.0 plus or minus 0.1 and 2.1 plus or minus 0.1. All these three answers are correct. Absolutely right. Even beyond that, they're absolutely right. Because we have given that error value plus or minus 0.1. So this is something that we have to always consider. The variability of experiments tells you the uncertainty of these predictions. So just doing experiment once is not going to say that it is accurate. Repeat your experiments. Of course, it is a cost. You have to plan it accordingly. And that's where we have to come up with the ADME. A is for absorption. Will it get inside or will it get absorbed? The drug will get absorbed through a small intestine of the human being. D is for distribution. After getting absorbed, will it get distributed? Metabolism is for, will it remain intact because it passes through cytochrome P450 and many other metabolic pathways. Is it going to break down or it is going to stay as it is? Or should we take a pro-drug strategy in the metabolic in order to make the drug remain intact? And finally, ease for excretion, will it stay in or will it going to accumulate or excrete properly? So this is where we need to understand how these ADME properties can be computationally predicted, how they are correlated. For every property, we have some dependent properties or dependent characteristics. So similarly, for absorption or for distribution, we have certain uh, structural or molecular chemical structure properties related. For example, it could be hydrogen bond donor, polar surface area, log P, log D, C log P, PK, a value very important, and many other factors. These together can influence how this is affecting the factors that are influencing the ADME properties. And then there are environmental and developmental toxicology properties and including something called as direct nexus. In human clinical trials, around 42 human endpoints is being already defined to understand in your compound, if there's any specific region which is already reported as uh, a toxicity to humans, basically. So this is an epoxide, which is a structure alert says that it's a plausible bacterial mutagen, which is already being reported as a human toxicity, uh, um, like a, a region for the compound. Wherever you see epoxide, they alert this. Not necessarily always, but it is that is what based upon evidence. So it is combining multiple arguments saying that certain probable, plausible, equivocal to understand how far these toxicity has to be considered. But again, there was a question that I was asking you, where, how do we know which region of the molecule is toxic? And that's where I told you, we have to implement structure activity relationship. Now you can see in this region, a little bit of reddish cloud coming up or yellowish reddish cloud that tells that that region is slightly toxic. The other regions are green that tells you that those regions are non-toxic. The property that you have taken for this particular prediction is carcinogenicity. So this is where we try to design new molecules based upon toxicity. But again, still there is a big question challenge. I'll put again the question to you. You think about it, brainstorm it. Let's imagine we have 10 compounds. If you're doing one single experiment to select the best one or two molecules, it's very easy. Either the higher value or the top the lowest value, we pick them up from the 10 compounds by a single experiment. But I have a different objective here. In drug discovery, it's not just single experiment. We might be having 10, 20 ex different experiments. Imagine for 10, all 10 compounds, I did 10 different experiments, different categorical experiment, toxicity, absorption, activity, et cetera, et cetera. All the 10 experiment data I have to consider in order to choose the best two molecules. I again repeat, I have to consider all 10 experimental data to consider the best two molecules from this 10. Generally, what we do, we do it one by one. First, we take the first experiment, the best we take, then do the next experiment. That's a wrong strategy at early stage. At a later stage, it's okay. So we have to think about 
how these data from in silico in vitro in vivo all have to put together and we have to prioritize which property is more important and the selection should be not only really based upon quality or score or value but also based upon the diversity of the molecule this is how we generally do currently of course i generally do currently but we have to change i also have to update my protocols so we just uh, find some compounds we do some potency studies we found some are inactive and we selected some of them are really good and then we did absorption rate studies we removed what are not absorbable and then some are absorbed we went with metabolic stability and finally we expect that we got a good compound unfortunately most of the time we does not happen the good compound might be thrown away at the stage of absorption because even though that compound had a good potency but the absorption rate might be very bad so you have to be very sure like uh, you don't end up with a non promising compound and this is the reason we have to consider all the properties together like 10 different experimental data together to choose the best two molecules so the best method that is implemented since 2010 it is there the question is are we using it that's a problem so that is called multi parameter optimization which is already there in star drop kind of tools where they try to combine different properties to rank the molecules and choose the best one not only really just considering activity but also considering toxicity pharmacokinetic properties and many other factors something similar to lipinski rule of five and this is already being well published in you can see the citation in 2010 this is being very well used in cns drugs uh, on pfizer uh, candidates and it was a very much successful approach now when you come up with this drug disc design i will end up my talk with this particular slide and one more we have to choose the methodology based upon the data availability and uh, this is something missing in many of the students when they do their project they first come up saying that i want to do drug discovery but they don't have an idea what data they have already in their mind without the right data you cannot implement any protocols so if you design all your project and you start and if you don't have data then that's where the hiccup starts so make sure that you do a pre analysis i hope all the faculties knows that because when you go for a funding agency for proposal they need to know what you have already done preliminary studies so make sure students also try to do the same strategy try to do a preliminary literature review and studies to understand what kind of data what extensive data you have before you actually propose that date, uh, project for your project work and this is very important otherwise you will have hiccups you have plan a plan b plan c plan d it goes on like that for your research of course even if you plan properly also it might change uh, that is how it is we cannot expect that everything to be positive so if we have a 3d structure crystal structure of protein with the ligands then we have to do a structure based drug designing approach which involves molecular docking but make sure molecular docking is not accurate you use any software 10 million word software still i say molecular docking is not accurate you have to do molecular dynamics in order to prove the molecular docking is true in many a times we can see that molecular dynamics fluctuates some of the confirmations of the molecular docking to make it very simple let's imagine i have paracetamol in my hand i know the crystal structure of the paracetamol single unit cell i consumed paracetamol it has a geometry when it is in my hand when i consumed it it went and bound with one of my protein target in my body do you think uh, the confirmation that i had in my hand or the shape that i had in my hand is going to change of course it's going to change when the confirmation changes that's where the paracetamol becomes bioactive the process of finding at which shape or which confirmation or which geometry the compound becomes active that is called molecular docking so that's the process we are trying to identify but you know uh, all atoms are in constant motion don't think that proteins are rigid it goes on fluctuating and moving around so we want to know when the drug comes and bind to the protein even though they are moving and fluctuating can the drug still go and bind and be stable docking cannot help you to understand that only molecular dynamics can help you to understand that so 
even in molecular dynamics if your if your compound can still stay there tightly bound you're successful and then you can believe those data let's imagine you have 3d structure of proteins but you couldn't find any of the compounds from any databases or any others and that's where we try to do fragment based drug design which is called scaffold hoping and de novo design and when you do not have a 3d structure of proteins in many cases like gpcrs and all you don't have many 3d structure of proteins available and then you have only the compound data available that's where you do ligand based approaches like pharmacophore similarity studies sar studies like qsar studies and others let's imagine you do not know the exact structure of proteins and the ligands that's where we do high throughput screening virtual screening is different high throughput screening is different so keep this in mind and then only decide which uh, particular approach you have to take based upon the data available to you don't think that all data is available out there the biggest challenge in ai and ml in drug discovery is that we do not have enough data the hype is still very high for ai but still we don't have enough data so the hypothesis you have to keep in mind how this proceeds so i'm just uh, skipping um, as it's already time yeah this is what i missed only two three slides so these are some of the uh, outcome from my group uh, back in india uh, we worked on a few projects like aging uh, longevity and that's where i'm uh, focusing for the past uh, five years and also a few other optimization techniques how to improve the efficacy and by reducing the toxicity so certain uh, object uh, uh, protocols being already being standardized and uh, that's all from me for today thank you so much for listening and if you have any questions i'm happy to take and if anybody is interested for the slides you can go to slide share not dot uh, net slash giribai you will get the slides that i presented today and uh, if you are interested in protein modeling uh, protein molecular dynamics uh, and if you do not want to run it them on your local computer you can go to this particular github you can run it on google colab that means you can still run it on your mobile phone with the chrome browser so that at least for learning purpose it will be easy for you to do and if you want to look at some tutorials you can go to the last link and if you have any more questions i'm happy to answer right now and if already time is up i can take it offline you can contact me via email thank you so much for this opportunity i hope uh, i i conveyed some message to you thank you so much thank you doctor uh, thank you for your elaborate lecture from just very simple drug designing to very multifaceted uh, target oriented work and enhancing our students our new researchers to get an idea so how we could go with the drug designing uh, going for multi property optimization and now uh, i think uh, we have a lecture uh, online lecture of dr swati peshwe she is waiting online uh may i request uh, uh, bosle ma'am to introduce her peshwe ma'am are you there yes madam i am there okay ma'am uh, it is my proud privilege uh, to introduce this speaker dr swati peshwe she is presently working as professor in department of microbiology government institute of science aurangabad she started her research career from one of the reputed research institute uh, in india neri nagpur and later on uh, she completed her phd in nagpur university itself she has one patent to her credit and two major projects have been completed by her which are funded by ugc she is a recognized phd guide in microbiology uh, dr baba sai ambedkar university aurangabad 10 research students have been completed their phd degree under her able guidance her research area includes enzyme technology and bioprocess development she has 38 research papers uh, to her credit which are published in journals of national and international repute 
uh, apart from this research career, she also holds some administrative responsibilities in Dr. Bamu University, uh, coordinator of NAC, member of BOS and RRC in uh, various disciplines, microbiology and biotechnology. And she is also a member of advisory committee in School of Life Sciences, this university also. So with this brief introduction, I welcome you, ma'am, again, and you start your lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hemlata. I'm, uh, am I audible? Okay. So uh, I'm sharing the screen. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me uh, to interact on this scientific platform. So uh, I hope I'm audible perfectly. I'm starting with my presentation. So I'm going to talk on sustainable development through microbial bioactive enzymes. So I thought of taking this topic because this is an international conference of advances in bioactive molecules and certainly enzymes are the bioactive molecules. So I thought of taking this uh, as a topic for presentation. It is more of student centric uh, presentation today. So uh, the sustainable development, what is the literal meaning of the word sustainable development? Uh, this is uh, economic development that is conducted without the depletion of natural resources. And this sustainable development, it continuously seeks to achieve social and economic progress in ways which will not exhaust the earth's finite natural resources. Yeah, so why there is a need of sustainable development? So uh, there are a number of products that we use in our daily life that includes paper, textile, food, feed, chemicals, pharmaceuticals. And uh, for the production of these products, uh, it consumes large amount of raw material and energy. And it also generates a large amount of, uh, 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 amount of waste. And it has an adverse impact on our environment and the quality of life. So uh, the industries uh, which are producing these products around the world, they are looking for an alternative technology that can deliver the increasing number of products that are in demand every year. And while uh, consuming fewer resources, which will have a cleaner impact on the environment. So biotechnology is certainly the roadmap to sustainable development because here we use the bio-based materials and uh, the production process, and it is called as a, an industrial biotechnology. So it is one of the alternative technology, which can be used uh, either to replace the conventional technologies or supplement the conventional technologies. And uh, it will help us in moving towards a cleaner production process. So among this biotechnology, the enzymatic processing is seen to be one of the very promising and sustainable alternative to conventional processing. So the use of enzymes is not very recent. It dates back, uh, it, it is about 2000 years ago that microorganisms were used in processes such as for the leavening of the bread or for sacrification of rice in koji production. So these uh, enzymes, uh, they uh, the, the use of these enzymes is rapidly increasing because uh, they, uh, 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 they reduce the processing time, they require less amount of energy, they are cost effective, so they are non-toxic, and of course, they are eco-friendly. So because of these characteristics, uh, the enzymes are being used by various industries. And moreover, the enzymes, they have got unique properties, like they, are, uh, they have a very high specificity. It's very easy to produce them and optimize them. They have a fast action. They, they, they make the process cost effective, biodegradability. So because of all these uh, reasons, the enzyme assisted processes in the industry, uh, they can be uh, run under milder conditions uh, with improved yield and of course, reduced waste generation. And the microbial enzymes, they are also capable of degrading toxic chemicals, which are, uh, uh, which are disseminated in the industrial and domestic waste, either by degrading the toxic uh, compounds or by converting them to non-toxic uh, intermediates. Now then why microbial enzymes? Why not plant enzymes or animal enzymes? Microbial enzymes are the most favored for in the, by the industries. It is because of the easy availability and fast growth rate of the microorganisms. And uh, we have the tools of recombinant DNA technology and protein engineering now. 
so that the microbes can be manipulated. They can be cultured in large quantities to meet the increasing demand of the enzymes in the industry. Another uh, uh, driving force which motivates the use of microbial enzymes is uh, the increased uh, demand of consumer, uh, then uh, the need of cost re uh, reduction. We need to conserve our natural resources and we also have to think about the environmental safety. So these are all the driving factors uh, which makes the microbial enzymes uh, more, um, I mean, uh, they can be used for uh, uh, industrial processes. So uh, the enzymes, the microbial enzymes can be produced by simple fermentation techniques like solid state fermentation or submerged fermentation. Moreover, we can go for hyperproduction of the microbial enzymes by manipulating them by, by overexpression of the genes, the microorganisms can overproduce the enzymes. And there is a tool called metagenomics, which can be used for uh, exploring the enzymes from non-culturable microorganisms. So there are a number of applications of microbial enzymes um, in paper pulp industry, leather industry, detergent, textiles, pharmaceuticals, uh, animal feed, personal care, and the list is endless. So today there is a need for new, improved, and more versatile uh, technique where uh, we can make use of uh, enzymes to develop more novel, more sustainable, and economically competitive production processes. So. Uh, the, in the, uh, already the enzymes have taken over a number of industrial processes, but in the next years, we, we, we will see a lot of exciting developments in the area of bio enzyme biotransformations. So uh, there are robust computational methods available uh, combined with direct evolution, high throughput screening technologies are there. Uh, similarly, we can go for protein engineering, designing of new enzymes. So this makes the uh, enzymes uh, more, uh, I mean, applicable in the industries. So uh, microbial enzymes uh, are the, the choice. They are more sustainable because uh, they can meet the demand of rapidly growing population, uh, the rising food supply of the rapidly growing population, and they can also cope up with the exhaustion of natural resources. So, and plus they have significant potential in waste management and uh, they help us in reaching towards the green environment. So a uh, number of uh, industries are using the enzymes. So this is a pictogram of uh, the enzyme application of enzymes in various industries, uh, be it pharmaceutical, baking, dairy, beverage, feed, biopolymer, paper pulp, leather, textile, cosmetic, detergents, organic synthesis, and of course, waste management. So these are the areas where the uh, enzymes are being used uh, uh, for production. So basically the industrial enzyme or the enzymes, uh, they find application in, in a production industry, environmental uh, management, as well as agricultural industry. So uh, I think I should not go waste my time in this uh, protocol for production of microbial enzyme. This is very well known to everyone. Uh, now I'm going to take you around some industries which have replaced the conventional chemical uh, processes by the enzyme uh, enzymes. So first one, which I'm going to talk about is uh, the food and beverage industry. So the food and beverage products are the major source of uh, actually environmental uh, impact because they, uh, there are, they consume large amount of agricultural uh, raw material. They consume a lot of energy and water. So because there is a growing population and grow, uh, uh, growing need of food uh, and beverage production, uh, the food and uh, beverage industry should think about reducing the uh, what you can say, um, having a less environmental impact, uh, uh, environmental impact. So the enzyme in the food industry can be divided into different sectors like baking, uh, dairy, juice production, cheese processing, beverage industry, and brewing, etc. So the enzymes have been used in these industries to increase the yield. So in the beverage industry, again, there are two groups, non-alcoholic and alcoholic. The non-alcoholic contains the soft drinks and packaged water, juices, et cetera. The alcoholic ones contain the uh, spirits, wine, beer. So uh, the enzyme find applications in the uh, various, uh, various uh, processes uh, in these industries. Uh, I'll take you to the table uh, where I'm, I want to show you that how the enzyme can be made, uh, how the use of enzyme uh, is more beneficial particularly uh, the phospholipase, the first enzyme which I have listed here. So the crude vegetable oils, you know, they contain phosphatide gums, uh, which adversely affect the quality and stability of the cooking oil, and they have to be removed by a process called as de -gumming. 
So conventionally, the degumming process is uh, carried out at a higher temperature, and it uses caustic soda, and it consumes a lot of energy. But if you replace this uh, conventional method by the enzymatic method, we can make use of phospholipase, uh, which hydrolyzes the phospholipids, and thereby we are saving on the chemicals that are used by the conventional method. We are saving on the energy, uh, and we are also saving, uh, making the process cost effective, and we are also making the uh, process environmental friendly. Uh, another example I would like to take here is about the hard stock production. Now, hard stock is a main component of margarine, uh, and it is produced by interesterification of vegetable oil. So, in the for the uh, conventional method. Uh, it runs at a very high temperature and they use an inor uh, inorganic catalyst, sodium methoxide. So a lot of heating, a lot of energy and, uh, is consumed here and there is a generation of an unwanted byproduct, which is blackish in color and which has to be treated again uh, uh, in a series of bleaching steps. So instead of these, if we use, I'm sorry, there's a spelling mistake here, this is lipase. So if lipase is used, uh, immobilized lipase rather, it makes the process uh, very uh, eco-friendly because no chemicals will be used and it can run at lower uh, energy. So we are saving on energy, we are saving on the use of chemicals and we are making the process eco-friendly. So likewise, so many other enzymes are also there which find application in the different food and beverage industry. For example, we go to bread production. Now in the bread, starch is the main constituent of the bread and the bread becomes hard and unpleasant to eat as it uh, ages. Uh, because the starch crystallizes. So the if you add uh, mylase and lipase, uh, it will uh, increase the shelf life of bread and it will uh, uh, it degrade starch and delays the hardening of the blade. Phospholipase is also used in mozzarella cheese production. So pectinase used for fruit juice clarification. Uh, so all this uh, makes the process, uh, saves so much money of the industry and it makes the process eco-friendly. Um, uh, so this is again a few examples. Uh, now we move on to the uh, dairy industry, uh, like the feed industry. Okay, so in case of uh, the feed industry, animal feed industry, there is a continuous increase in the demand of milk uh, and uh, the meat, uh, meat consumption because of the growing population. Uh, so growth of the feed enzyme, it occurred very steadily. Uh, feed enzymes can increase the digestibility of the nutrients and higher feed utilization of the animal so that you get more amount of meat. So uh, these feed enzymes, they are added in diet formulations uh, so that they can degrade a specific feed component which was otherwise very harmful or which was not having a non-nutritional value. So number of enzymes are used in the feed, uh, animal feed. So of the constituents of animal feed, the feed that is formulated for animals, uh, they are not degraded by the livestock and therefore uh, energy, protein and minerals, whatever is available in that animal feed, it is not fully utilized. So uh, uh, feed and mineral consumption uh, is more than the amount of meat that is produced by the uh, livestock. So uh, the production process, uh, production of feed and inorganic supplement is energy intensive and the undigested nutrients are excreted by the livestock and it leads to environmental problem. So enzymes are uh, comes, comes to the rescue of this problem. Enzymes are capable of de degrading these uh, complex components in the feed and uh, they make, uh, they increase the energy nutrient value of the feed and they reduce the emission of the environment. So there are three important enzymes which are uh, used in animal feed. They increase the energy and nutrient value of the feed as well as they reduce the emission of uh, uh, pollutants in the environment. For example, phytase. Phytase is added to poultry feed production. So uh, phytic acid is the component of uh, 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 many naturally occurring plants and the um, uh, ruminants can digest this phytic acid because they have the indigenous microflora in their gut. But the monogastric animals, they are not able to hydrolyze this phytase. So therefore, inorganic phytase is to be uh, added, uh, inorganic phosphorus is to be added to their uh, feed so that to make up the demand of inorganic, uh, to make up the demand of phosphorus. But if you add phytase, uh, the hydro, it will hydrolyze the phytic acid and it will release the phosphorus which is bound in the field. So in this way, we are saving on the addition of inorganic phosphorus and by the excretion of inorganic phosphorus leads to eutrophication. So this can be prevented. Uh, 
Xylanase is another uh, animal feed enzyme. It can depolymerize the xylan and it can enhance the digestibility of the xylan. It is a dietary fiber present in the cereal uh, cell walls and it is an energy rich constituent of animal feed. But it is it cannot be digested by the monogastric animals. So therefore, before adding to the feed, the uh, xylan is treated with xylanase enzyme. So uh, similarly, protease, it, it can be added to the animal feed. So it, it will hydrolyze the proteins in the feed so that more amount of protein, uh, so increase the digestibility of the proteins and improve the feed, uh, improve the uh, produce. So these are the uh, enzymes uh, which are sustainable. They increase the energy and nutrient value of the feed and they reduce the emission in the environment. Now we move on to the paper and pulp industry. Uh, in the traditional paper and pulp industry, a uh, lot of chemicals and mechanical processing is used, which consumes a lot of raw material energy and it, can, and it creates a lot of pressure on the environment. So uh, if you use the enzyme, the utilization of enzyme will reduce the uh, processing time, it will uh, pr uh, reduce the energy consumption and it will reduce the amount of chemicals that are used in the processing. So these are certain enzymes using in the, used in the paper and pulp industry, um, uh, particularly when the uh, pulp from the recycled paper is used for production of paper, de-inking is one of the process. Uh, the ink needs to be removed before the paper can be used again. So the conventional de-inking process uses a lot of chemicals like sodium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, et cetera. But if we replace these chemicals with cellulase, uh, the process of de-inking is made uh, environmental friendly. Uh, similarly, for bleaching to making the, uh, the main constituents of the wood are cellulose, lignin, and xylan. And in paper making, the lignin uh, is gives a dark color to the paper. So therefore, a uh, lot of bleaching procedure is to be carried out. So which uses chlorine and alkali chemicals in this process, which are toxic to the environment. So therefore, xylanase, lacase, and cellulase can be used for the bleaching process and make the paper, uh, make the process environmentally friendly. So we are saving on chemicals, use of chemicals, we are saving on the energy, and we are making the process fast by making use of the enzymes. Uh, next in the queue, uh, where a lot of enzymes are being used is the detergent industry. Uh, enzymes are present in the detergents. Uh, uh, they contribute uh, to uh, strengthening of the uh, uh, power of the detergents. So uh, in addition to the laundering, the, uh, detergents are used in domestic, industrial, institutional cleaning, dishwashers, etc. Enzymes, particularly in the detergents, are used for removing the stains uh, and to increase the effectiveness of the detergents. Surfactant, so uh, when the enzymes were not added to the detergents, the main component of detergent is surfactants. So these surfactants were added to remove the stains from the clo uh, clothes before laundry washing. And these surfactants, they are more active at a higher temperature and considerable amount of energy is, or, uh, is used for heating the laundry water, particularly in the colder countries. So, uh, and these surfactants, when they are released into the environment after washing, they are toxic to the aquatic species and they, they have to be removed by a, a very efficient wastewater treatment plants. But if you use enzymes in place of uh, nowadays, the surfactants have been replaced by the enzymes. Enzymes have the capacity to degrade the stains, uh, remove the stains at low washing temperature and the enzymes are non-toxic to the, uh, when they are released into the environment. So protease, lipase, amylase, these are the en enzymes used in the detergents. Uh, example is uh, where there is a laundry washing and uh, they, the laundry can be run at a lower uh, heat, uh, lower uh, temperature. So uh, energy consumption is minimized and disposable, uh, disposal of harsh chemicals in the environment can be avoided if you use detergents uh, fortified with enzymes. So uh, now we move on to the next application that is leather industry. Uh, there are a number of, uh, 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 there are several processes in which, uh, uh, in the leather processing where very harsh chemicals are used. So production and disposal of, disposal of these chemicals, uh, they pose a lot of environmental uh, problem associated with the disposable of, uh, disposal of leather uh, industry effluent. So enzymes uh, are, are an answer to this. Initial attempt for application of enzyme in leather industry was made for dehairing process, where the hair from the animal hides are removed. So proteases, lipases, amylases, they are used. 
uh, they minimize the dependence on harmful chemicals because before the use of enzymes, harmful chemicals like sulfides and amines and lime was used for dehairing process. So enzymes are uh, enzymes enhance the leather quality and make the process uh, eco-friendly because they are non-toxic, even if, if at all they are released in the environment. So these are the enzymes which are used in the leather industry. Alkaline protease, neutral protease, lipase, amylase, they are, they are used for their different functions in the leather processing, but all of them, they save on the use of energy and they save on the use of chemicals, making the process cost-effective and environmental friendly. Textile industry uh, also uh, uh, generates a lot of waste because uh, for desizing of fabrics, bleaching chemicals and dye, a lot of chemicals are used in the textile industry. So uh, uh, the enzymes are used to allow the development of environmental friendly technology in fiber processing and to improve the final product quality. So these are the various uh, applications, scouring and uh, uh, different applications are there in the textile industry. Uh, scouring, bleaching, removal of wool fiber, degumming of steel, uh, silk, then de denim finishing, and uh, removal of uh, size uh, lubricants, uh, which are added to the fiber before weaving the fiber. So all the enzymes are used uh, for in all these uh, processes, and they have uh, replace the use of chemicals in all these processes in textile industry and uh, thereby saving the energy, water, chemicals, uh, heat, electricity, and so many things. So, and yeah, uh, microbial enzymes in the cosmetic industry. Uh, enzymes are used as free radical scavengers in sunscreen, uh, sunscreen lotions, toothpaste, mouthwashes, hair weaving and dyeing, uh, 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 the superoxide dismutase uh, is used to arrest the free radicals and to control the damage to the skin caused by air, water pollution, microbes, and other harmful factors. Superoxide dismutase and peroxidase, they are used in combination in sunscreens uh, as free radical scavengers to reduce the problem of erythema. And proteases are used in the skin creams to smoothen the skin, peeling off the dead or damaged skin. So uh, some of the ingredients uh, which are used in the cosmetic industry, they are produced by chemical catalysts, catalysis of plant or petrochemical based raw materials. So these all these processes, they run at a very high temperature and considerable amount of byproducts are generated because of the unspecific action of the chemical catalyst. So specific enzymes, they can be used to replace the chemical catalyst, uh, improving the yield and reducing the byproduct and waste generation. So these are the microbial enzymes in cosmetics, superoxide dismutase, protease, endoglycosidase, lactase, lipase. So uh, they have different role to play. Some of them are used in creams, hair dye, skincare creams. Uh, they are used in the toothpastes, etc. So this is how uh, use of enzymes in cosmetic industry can make the process uh, eco-friendly. Uh, last but not the least, the microorganisms, uh, microbial enzymes used in the pharmaceutical and analytical industry. As we all know that uh, uh, enzymes are used as therapeutic drugs to address the health issues. They are used to correct the dis uh, enzyme deficiency disorders. They are used to correct the, they are used for diagnostic purpose. They are used to design the ELISA kits, the biosensors for analysis of, bio, uh, new, uh, for ana analytes in the biological sample. They are used uh, in immunoassays. So uh, the re radioactive elements have been replaced by very sensitive immunoassays now. So uh, enzymes have a lot of applications in the field, field of pharmaceutical and analytical industry. Now, when the synthesis of pharmaceutical in ingredients are, uh, is done, the, it involves several steps and number of operations, which consumes a lot of energy, chemicals, and it generates hazardous waste, which leads to environmental impact. Pharmaceutical companies are therefore always under pressure to develop and implement environmental friendly processes. So the application of enzymes in pharmaceutical ingredient synthesis has the potential to reduce the environmental load. So these are a few examples of enzymes used in the pharmaceutical industry, which save uh, the chemicals, they save on the energy, and they uh, have a control on the waste generation. So uh, penicillin amidase is used for the uh, application process is six amino penicillinic acid production. You use penicillin amidase uh, and uh, uh, it uh, the acid uh, acylates penicillin molecule and saves on chemical and energy. So these are few examples which have been cited here, uh, where the enzymes are used in for the production of pharmaceutically important compounds. 
uh, enzymes used in therapeutics. We know all this anticoagulants, antibiotic synthesis, antioxidant, skin ulcers. So all these are applications of enzymes in the therapeutic field. Uh, enzymes are used in waste treatments because uh, industrial effluent as well as the domestic effluent, they contain chemical commodities which are hazardous, toxic to the ecosystem. So uh, the enzymes, they can be used to treat the industrial effluents uh, by degrading them or converting them to less toxic uh, products. These are few examples of enzymes used in the waste treatment. Uh, uh, for nitrile containing waste, uh, amidases are used for degradation of keratinic waste, proteases are used. Uh, so these are few examples of enzymes used for waste treatment. Yeah, now uh, whenever we uh, talk about uh, research on enzymes, these are the some of the objectives which need to be considered. You should have a potential enzyme producing microorganism. You should optimize the process, make the process cost effective. Uh, you, you should be able to scale up the process, downstream processing, characterization of enzyme, strain improvement, immobilization for its effective application, bioinformatic uh, characterization of enzyme and application of enzyme. So most of my students have been working on enzymes. So these are my, uh, their objectives before starting the research on enzymes. We have to have some considerations before we start with uh, the research on enzymes. that what is the nature of organism? Can we go for solid substrate fermentation or submerged fermentation? What would be the yield of this type of fermentation? What is going to be the cost? What is the initial investment? How the product can be recovered? Uh, uh, then uh, are there any environmental issues uh, associated with this process? Uh, is there any production of byproduct? Uh, which will uh, reduce the cost uh, likewise. So some considerations are to be made before you go uh, embark on the journey on research on enzymes. So these are a uh, uh, few uh, points uh, which my students have uh, taken up uh, while doing their research on enzymes. I would like to uh, draw your attention to the optimization of enzyme production. Here we have optimized the production media by using uh, readily available uh, waste substances, a uh, waste substrate like agro waste, and we have optimized the enzyme production, making it cost effective. I'm not going to show here how we have reduced the cost, but uh, you can approach me, uh, anyone can approach me so that I can show you the cost dynamics. So optimization of medium was done by two approaches, one variable at a time approach, as well as we have been using the uh, statistical optimization by using response surface methodology. So one or two case studies I'm going to show. Um, uh, then why statistical optimization is to be carried out because uh, they reduce the process variability, they give you a closer confirmation of the output response, they improve the yield, and they reduce the development time. So always statistically uh, optimized design should be followed for, uh, optim uh, for the uh, process development. So these are the two uh, approaches which we generally use, the placket Berman design and the central composite uh, design for uh, the uh, statistical optimization of the uh, production medium. Uh, we also uh, have uh, uh, used this strategy of immobilization because if you immobilize the things, you make the process even more cost effective because repeatedly we can make use of the enzyme. There is a uh, product separation becomes very convenient and uh, this immobilization matrix confers stability to the enzyme. So, um, in the last 15 years, uh, my students have worked on the production of biomolecules. Uh, so enzymes, antibiotics, and microbial probe. Yes, we have developed a microbial probe for early diagnosis of rice blast disease. So in all these, uh, 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 in all these topics, we have made the process cost effective, uh, tried to make the process cost effective by using agrovics. So this is a list of uh, topics uh, on which my students have completed their PhD. Uh, 10 students have completed their PhD and most of them uh, have done their PhD on enzymes. So all are bioactive uh, molecules. So I wanted to show this list. So uh, I'm just going to take you around some major findings of one or two of my students. Uh, like the, this was the first uh, topic done by my first PhD student where she has done a production uh, optimization, kinetic and clinical importance of microbial aspargenase. As we all know, aspargenase is used for the treatment of acute lymphoblastic lumen, uh, uh, leukemia and tumor cells. The cells of the, uh, the tumor are not able to synthesize uh, 
uh, the ls pagin and it relies on the ls pagin from the circulating plasma pool so if we inject this ls paginase uh, intravenously it will decrease the available concentration of ls pagin starving the tumor cells and inhibiting the protein synthesis and their ultimate death so e coli and irvinia cartovera arpaginases are currently used in medical uh, field as efficient drugs in the treatment of lymphoblastic leukemia however it was observed that repeated administration of this uh, ls paginase from these two sources leads to hypersensitivity reaction so there is always a need to explore other sources for ls paginase production so this is the reaction which generates ls partate and ammonia so this is the strategy used by my student for isolation of ls paginase production this is a modified zapadrox medium where she has introduced phenol red so that when the uh, ls paginase uh, is produced this production of ammonia makes the color uh, pink and she was able to isolate some ls paginase producers here qualitatively quantitative screening was secondary screening was done on the basis of enzyme production so these are the three organisms which were selected bacterial actinomycetes and fungal uh but uh, by doing extensive literature survey we uh, noticed that a uh, lot of work, na, not much work has been carried on fungal aspaginase and our fungus as fungal isolate was giving a uh, good amount of aspaginase uh, initially so we thought of sticking to this uh, aspaginase so we identified it and it was identified as aspergillus niger with this accession number then we produced uh, we optimized the uh, statistically optimized the medium produced the uh, enzyme went for purification i molecular weight determination was there uh, in the native electrophoretic pattern we got a single band so i am very hurriedly going through these findings because this is an enzyme which is to be given intravenously we wanted to see whether it is stable at uh, in presence of other components present in the serum so we did this uh, work uh, where we incubated the enzyme with the human serum and uh, we found that uh, even after 96 hours present uh, its presence with the human serum gives 52.32% activity we also performed the lal test uh, to that is the pyrogen test although this uh, enzyme was a from a fungal source uh, but uh, bacterial endotoxin can always creep in through the buffers and the whatever chemicals that we use water that we use in the purification process so we did this a uh, lal test and uh, it was well within the uh, uh, endotoxin concentration was well within the permissible limits laid down by the fda then we went for some in silico studies structure prediction structure validation determination of ligand 3d structure and protein docking so we use various softwares for that this uh, this is a comparative account on the left hand side is the molecular docking of our fungal aspaginase on the right hand side is the molecular docking of the commercially used bacterial aspaginase and after analyzing the docking uh, uh, results uh, we found that uh, the how many uh, hydrogen bonds ionic bonds and van der waals interactions as well as pi interactions are there between the enzyme and the substrate and overall more number of inter interacting bands were observed in case of fungal aspaginase as compared to the bacterial aspaginase then we went for cytotoxic studies against the tumor cell lines uh, two cytotoxic studies were uh, two tests were carried out mtt and srb we used two different cell lines for that uh, and uh, it was observed that uh, there was a gradual uh, decrease in the viability of leukemia cells by increasing the dosage of ls paginase we also computed uh, the uh, uh, the ld50 dose for this uh, then uh, we compared it uh, we used two cell lines as i said human leukemia cell lines malt4 and human breast cancer cell lines mcs7 and we compared the uh, uh, action of uh, fungal ls paginase crude ls paginase standard ls paginase and one anti cancer drug adriamycin and it was very much comparable so uh, <coughs> this was uh, what i wanted to show uh, another uh, case study which i would show is we have produced an antibiotic which is effective against methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus this was done by one of my student rupali padalkar uh, so we know that how uh, antibiotic resistance is um uh, is an important uh, problem uh, is a matter of concern these days so we thought of working on uh, antibiotic against mrsa because uh, it is becoming increasingly prevalent and uh, it is highly uh, drug resistant so there is always so uh, that time daptomycin linezolids they were used against mrsa but uh, uh, this mrsa uh, the staphylococcus aureus is so not Uh, it is so notorious that it uh, it gains a resistance 
uh, to any antibiotic that is used. So this is the sensitivity and resistance pattern of the uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus that we isolated from the hospital environment. And it was showing resistance to practically uh, most of the antibiotics except gentamicin. But gentamicin uh, cannot be administered because it leads to deafness. So we were looking for a more uh, a few actinomycetes which could produce um, uh, antibiotic against MRSA. So this was, there were four actinomycetes that we shortlisted and uh, labeled as R5, R6, R13, and RS2. Uh, this is the um, secondary screening of this uh, act, uh, antibiotic. And we found that this RS2 is showing uh, some promise against the MRSA. So this was the, it was identified as streptomyces. Uh, this is the scanning electron micrograph of it. Then we also identified it uh, uh, by uh, this method, 16S RDNA gene sequencing method, and it was identified as streptomyces. Then we optimized the medium uh, by statistical method. Uh, then we tried to identify this. We tried to identify this uh, purification of this antibiotic was done by preparative HPTLC and we observed two bands in it. So it indicated that our antibiotic preparation has got two components are there. Tried to determine the MIC of it. Then we tried to determine the probable structure of the two components, KP1, KP2, by following different strategies, chemical screening, UV spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy, and mass spectroscopy. Uh, so, and we also tried to determine the structure, probable structure uh, of this component uh, by using the Metlin software. So the KP1 was identified as alpinine, and the KP2 was uh, identified as beta citriurin. Further work is going on on this aspect, uh, so like uh, uh, which I have not added uh, into this particular presentation. So mm, I think uh, uh, I'm running out of time, so I will skip some of the slides and I will directly go to the conclusion. Uh, yesterday, my student has already presented this uh, about phytase. Uh, yeah. So uh, generally what we observe is that whatever research that we uh, do in the laboratory, uh, it does not reach out. So there is no transfer of research to commercial product. So we have to, uh, there's a gap between the research done in the laboratory and uh, actually commercial production. So we need, to, uh, we need to bridge this gap. We need to work out on this to bridge this gap. So yeah, and then if companies, uh, when the companies are formed, uh, we, need, we as an academician should also be involved in uh, the uh, setting up of the company. We should learn entrepreneurship skills. We should be proactive so that we can transfer our research from lab to land. So uh, these are the barriers in using enzymatic processing uh, in industry. It is very promising to use enzyme, uh, uh, enzyme uh, in the industry because it is taking you towards a cleaner industrial production. But there are certain barriers, lack of, no lack of knowledge of enzymatic processes. Traditional thinking is there among the manufacturers and suppliers. And of course, government bureaucracy during approval of new solutions in many countries, uh, which uh, tend to delay the application of enzyme, uh, implementation of enzymes in the industries. So certain steps should be taken to accelerate uh, the use of enzymes in the industry to make uh, enzyme make the process environmental friendly so these are uh, certain recommendations which should we all should think about it uh, for making the uh, processes uh, enzymatic so so enzymes are the only solution to uh, sustainable development uh, they reduce the contribution to global warming acidification eutrophication photochemicals, ozone formation, energy consumption. So thank you very much for uh, patient hearing. So if there are any questions, Dr. Hemlata, are you there? So we can have one or two quick questions from the audience. If not, thank you, ma'am. But, sir, sir, you need a mic then. <laughs> you please do come over here.
thank you madam it's a very nice talk and very i can say little lengthy also but uh, i have the one question yes yell asparaginase yes sir kilo dalton this protein how yeah. you kilo dalton this protein and how it is interpreted uh, uh, in uh, uh, penetrate into the tumor cells and what is the pharmacory score of the that uh, particular proteins uh, uh, sir actually we have not worked out on that score and all we have just yeah. shown the feasibility of using this enzyme as an anti cancer drug and it is a known fact that lspaginase yeah. is being used as an anti cancer drug only thing is that we have changed the source instead of using the uh, uh, bacterial lspaginase we have tried to show the feasibility of fungal lspaginase okay second thing is this uh, you have the some antibiotics yes. yeah yeah that uh, it is the molecular weight somewhere 415 Does it qualify the rule of five the drug discovery? How? Mm. What? No, I, no. At least they have qualified minimum three out of the five rules. So, did you have uh, checked those? Um, no, 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 sir. Quali- we we have uh, we have not uh, got gone into those details. We have just shown that the anti MRSA antibiotic is produced. Further uh, studies are in progress. Yeah, because it's, uh, starting those kind of the analysis first, we should. Check those qualify the rule of five or not. Yes, uh, sir. Unless yes, sir. Uh, you use the any uh, chemicals, uh, it gives some uh, kind of the result, and you can show that we have we also working on that line. So yes, sir. Several comments. If then now we stick very uh, clearly on that. Unless that uh, molecules uh, not qualify the rule of five, we should okay, not sir. approach at all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look that. Okay. Yes, thank sir. you. It's very nice but very lengthy. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Iman. Thank you for your very elaborate lecture, co- comprising of uh, application of this uh, microbial enzymes in food, feed, pharma, analytical paper, detergent, leather, tox- uh, textile, cosmetic, waste management. Your various approach uh, towards uh, better. Uh, you have talked about statistical approach. Uh, I suggest to ma'am, we can go for systems approach. towards the enzyme production and for the application thank yes, you ma'am sir. thank you thank you nice sir. presentation uh, now we will have a talk of uh, karaj sir uh, before inviting him to the podium i request uh, chavan sir kadam sir to introduce hello hello good afternoon uh, i am happy to introduce professor arun kharas sir kharas uh, sir is basically msc microbiology he completed phd from indian institute of science bangalore pdf post doctorate fellow <coughs> from france actually i have not suspect <laughs> France uh, and uh, Rockefeller University in New York. Area of specialization: <laughs> bacterial <laughs> antibiotic. <laughs> 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 the regions from maratoda who don't know in introductions briefly i will say arun kharas sir is a best academician best researchers and he is with us today to deliver his presentations among this audience welcome sir thank you
थैंक यू सो वेरी मच प्रोफेसर कदम सर और सर आई एम द स्टूडेंट आर सिटिंग हियर वेरी हंग्री विथ लेफ्ट और नो पेशेंस बट लेट्स सी हाउ वी कैन सेल थ्रू टूगेदर Dr Pillai's presentation was indeed a big feast for all of you including teachers not just a student he is a phenomenal teacher a wonderful person one thing that i loved and admitted by him and i teach in my class also tell me how many industries have nobel prize i can tell you 10 nobel prize to a university and i can give you the list of universities he was very humble in appreciating that most of the background work is coming from the academic back and done by the university or the researchers working in different academic institutions trust me the 10 to 11 year period he said to come a drug in the market is a result of machine learning and artificial intelligence earlier on there was a theoretical biologist and theoretical chemists who were in general called modelers and otherwise what would happen most of the experiments would be carried but resulting in no productivity so hundred fold west up academic publication has been reduced due to the technological intervention so even if technology does not do much technology helps you addressing issue with a computational modeling and a few minutes before even bexer said systemic approach that's also another you know system biology is a new field we work in that but i'm not going to talk about system biology today i'm going to talk about a very little aspect one of the aspects of phytochemicals and um, well um that also part he has told you about charak sanhita and that is the base even for me to begin with uh, the phytochemicals this will be a mix some part exclusively for the student and then a research also uh, so let's move further if i can have a next slide please do yourself because sometimes this doesn't move i i learn so it's best that you move it for me okay so two aspect as i told the anti cancer and the anti microbials these are the going concern and i do remember perhaps 45 years before 46 years before i was hardly able to see like a death and understanding by death and the first death that i remember cancel zala cancel even the community in barshi was not knowing a disease was called cancer which is the second maharashtra's cancer center the first is tata memorial and second one is in barshi nargis dat memorial right i don't want to go into the details of it but people used to say to mela tala cancel jala and cancel jala manje to mansatun cancel jala so that was like a interpretation somebody is cancelled from the list and that's what the disease is. so i think i was in a first standard at that time ani bau saheb jhadbuke varle hote cancel and that was the college where i studied later on i did not know i am going to take my higher education in the same college where bau saheb jhadbuke is you know uh name and his own institution would be so from that point also and before that decades people have been investigating on anti cancers the people biology people there are lots of phytochemicals have been studied and at the moment in chemotherapeutics nine chemicals have been properly used as anti cancers in medicine practice globally in a in a in a competitive and what we call like a modern medicine not just like a testing in the laboratory nine different compounds are used in a chemotherapeutic one of them i am going to show also as a comparative standard and some under question from our own research so it is suffice enough to say that even after 7 year 7 8 
research, some amount of progress is there in anti-cancer development, but it is not to the satisfaction. As you know, the deaths on the account of cancer are several lakhs annually in India. We are not even wanting to tell how many people are identified suffering with different type of cancers because it is either identified in the third stage or the fourth stage. Despite so much of education, so much of awareness spread into the society. But good news is that many cancers can be completely cured up to a third stage if identified. And to some extent, even the four stage cancers, topical cancers can be covered. But if it is a systemic cancer, it's not even a secondary, ternary or tertiary. That would be difficult to treat because you might be targeting an organ, but it is spread all, it is called multisystemic failure case or multisystemic cancerous case. It would be like really cancer case, kind of that. So that means again, there is a hope, right? They still hope to do the research in the field of uh, anti-cancer studies. Next slide. Yeah, for over, um, for over 35 years, there has been no new antibiotic in the market. You must be reading the names of antibiotic, but they are neither new with reference to the new target site identified or new molecule with the nucleus with a new mode of action. Neither of them are there. All of them are derivatives. And what just told by Pesha Madam Methicillin, which was introduced in the 50s, within one and a half year, the resistance was reported in UK. I don't know for some reason, UK is a place, Dunya Chisagri Papatita Suguriota. Even NDM1, New Delo Metallo Proteus, was identified in UK in 2008. And that was a question how come Delhi is there in UK? Is there a city called New Delhi in UK? But you know, these are the molecular detailed studies showing where the origin of the strain or the enzyme was. Found. I'm not going to go into that detail. So, so I work on beta lactamase and beta lactamase inhibitors in detail, but I'm not going to talk that that part also. I'm just going to get you walk you through a very small aspect that we do it in the phytochemical. But it is sufficient enough to say that you are using antibiotic as a sword, and organisms from the beginning have been doing resistance on their part. Strivad antibiotic resistance in society, right? The more you trouble her, the stronger she will repulse with. So microbes will also, it is basically survival of fittest, right? Everybody wants to survive, why not? That's also a life, also that life too has a reason. One of the beautiful things, Jari, Sthari, Kashti, Pashani, microbes are there, okay? Where? Silicone sand is filled with the microbiota. And you're not able to cultivate in minimal medium in the lab. That's the biggest failure over two centuries research in the field of microbiology. We have not been able to understand or cultivate them in the lab as much as more than 99% microbes from the nature. Because we haven't understood the requirement. It's not just what women wants. It's not clear to microbiologists what microbes want. And the most arrogant, egoist biologists are microbiologists, though I am a microbiologist. We always felt, I, one of my favorable statement, until October 1998, microbes thought we can make E. coli sing and dance the way we want it. Because they had an ego that we know this pathway, we know that pathway, and we know E. coli can do this. And that was the first genome deceivingly came in the market, MG1655, K12 strain. <clears throat> and with that advent, we came to know microbiology, our all illusions came down to the earth, stating that only 4% microbiology or metabolic aspects of E. coli were micro, microbiology scientists. And with that 4%, we were thinking she can sing for us, she can dance for us. No way. And from 1998 till today, we have 24 years journey. We haven't added 1% to it. It's not easy to understand E. coli. Although she is a mother of all recombinant DNA technology. Of course, her 
her sister is acromesis cerebaceae but see what do you perceive what do you think in the classroom in the practical or in the research everybody is asking like application oriented blah blah but it's quite tough so bacteria it just is not like a resistance we have a favorite terms these days multiple drug resistance extensively drug resistance high drug resistance is not a scientific term highly resistance is not a scientific term the journal will easily reject your paper you don't even know the term it about what you have done the science xdr pan drug resistance and the superbugs i do remember in 2000 i myself was on the tv in usa superbugs and because our lab was very well known in the whole world for staphylococci in two, and we, we we were having the collection of more than 40000 methicillin resistant staphylococcal staphylococcus aureus in our lab in new york more than 40000 coming from africa western europe japan south america and of course us no doubt about it. so those that is a huge collection can you imagine in 2001 40000 staphylococcal strains which are mrs incredibly big collection i only hope we can have such collection in india i i don't know what will be the practical possibility but anyways but today india is becoming a home age for superbugs what is superbug i'll tell you nowhere in the slide it is mentioned so if you don't listen and if you don't notice you are not going to get it even if i give you the slides okay it is a it is a organism resistant to all of the antibiotics prescribed not by your doctor in india not by your doctor by the academy none of the doctors in india follow the academy advices they are all businessmen right they think that if you if you don't get recovered the mouth publicity will go against him so he will prescribe any antibiotic whether it is recommended for that bacterium for that fungus by the particular academy of infectious diseases indian academy of infectious diseases they don't follow as a result of which now we have super strains from acinetobacter baumani and pseudomonas erogenosa imagine superbug was first superbug of world is staphylococcus aureus by india we have superbugs from pseudomonas erogenosa and acinetobacter baumani what is a coincidence both are aerobic gram negative community hospital community acquired infectious that is escape pathogens right there are two uh, three aspects gram negative enterobacterial and aerobics and gram positives which is staphylococcus aureus and entero entero enterococcus faecalis anyway so these are the things and still we look forward for chemical antibiotics have given a resistance as a response within 6 months to 2 year at the max all right so today therefore the world is looking for two important aspect can we really find out a best antimicrobial or the plant based another compound which will improve the mechanism of this antibiotic so inhibitors of certain enzymes or or certain inter biological system under a word called a reversion of antibiotic resistance that's a new area where reversion of antimicrobial resistance is at another new area coming up and that's because it's not that we hope to get an antibiotic from the plant but a phyto phytochemical molecule might interfere might neutralize interfering mechanism so that antibiotic will get a chance to act that is the thing or bioavailability if it was titrating out by some enzymatic means the enzyme will be inhibited and as a result of which antibiotic gets and a classical example would be beta lactamase inhibitor well tell tell classes clavulanic as competitive inhibitor of pbp3 then salbactam tazobactam these are the three known to you people from the books but i work on seven different blis okay and one of the student who has submitted and completed
inhibitors in addition to these three beta lactamase inhibitors we also work on so plants are a hope and what is the hope in plant the chemicals phytochemicals right next slide please next slide please in ayurveda as we know it is treated as a traditional alternative medicine right so that's that's not considered as a medicine and even aaj bhi hindu muslimon ki tarah jhagda hota hai pathi versus ayurveda it's like a two different religions living in the same house right somebody believes in ayurveda it's like a believing or not believing whether it works that's a secondary question but if your psychology is negative never mind it is going to work it will not work in that individual because your half of the recovery lies in the your psychology and if you are going to have a resistance towards a plant based medicine ayurveda forget don't take it just don't take it it's not going to make any so that's the the thing so extracts are prepared from the different plant parts and they are used for controlling the uh, metabolic disorders which is called generally non communicable diseases as well as infectious diseases that is that could be viral disease a uh, bacterial disease parasitic disease or fungal disease right or uh, etc now let's go to the next slide yeah for example shatavari kal has been practiced for thousands of years in india this is one of the interesting example i always give in the class and the galactagog has been prescribed for decades unfortunately the, the patent of shatavari does not come to india it goes to usa because they characterize the functional molecule which is lactate and coincidentally when chapter was elucidated it was found that it is again a galactago manje andharat jari aslo tari apan ekach manjil ek hi hai dono ki improve the lactation even the vehicle was different but the root was same right it was a galactago prescribed by the allopathicians and now with this kinds of certain examples even your turmeric uh, has a curcumin that has also been accepted molecule and used in the uh, anti cancer therapy so there has been a lots of examples the modern medical scientist have appreciated ayurveda potential or medicinal plant or natural therapeutic potential in lots of labs around the globe except in india today if you write a project with ayurveda your project is going to be outrightly rejected it will be treated as a right winger project so that will have no future right but at the same time europe usa australia they have patents i like the word has said uh, said by uh, pillai that more drugs are not coming from india because we never gave any importance to the translational research and as you go to any examine you find everybody is doing anti cancer and anti microbial potential same experiment same plant repeatedly done under the same supervisor batch of the student but we don't take it further that's the issue and now galact galactago from the shatavari the credit goes to them curcumin credit goes to them we can only keep on saying haldi hamari yahan pe bahut saalon se sadiyon se use kar rahe hain that's why we are surviving the covid who denies that no one but do you work on your problem do you get the credit or not recently guruji jo south indian bhul gaya naam kya bolte hai usko ha huh? youth uh, uh, youth youth is very fascinated with him he said we will spend two years on usa and do meditation india will follow it otherwise i will spend my whole life indians won't follow it and that's very true sooner or later your yoga is going to be american no more indian because now you are using yoga mat which is synthetic which is completely against the yoga and you are doing yoga on on anti yoga principle right and because it has come from america they call it a pillet one of the ashtang yogas is actually sharala fold karan and that's a pillet now they have developed a new name and new 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 line which is actually one of the ashtang yogas but we never claimed it so what if tomorrow somebody claims that pillet is an innovative 
yoga improving the metabolic processes cognition improving one of the asanas we used to do is stretch, ear stretching and bending amala shiksha dile je tumhala shiksha dili tar tumhi shikshakala shiksha dala ta because kayda alla karat nahi atsa we are not allowed to punish students but this was the test i think i think all of these who are sitting in the front line might have seen or gone through that at least once in a life and now america has published a paper that it increases a focus and cognition there you go jo wand hota tala shiksha milale ani to sudharla chadi lage chamcham vidhe gam right or wrong and now if you do it there will be case on that teacher that's why i said it's illegal okay so there are lots of example curcumin ada thoda vaise kon turmeric and and you can see like lots of examples are coming and there are lot more thousands are awaiting go ahead next please move okay doesn't matter doesn't matter so basically you'll have to do the certain uh, surveys about the plant and what comes is from the traditional medicine so you must speak with the traditional people right arunachal says sarma sir hai unhone bhi bola ki they have already communicated with the uh, people from the tribal knowledge we should use that knowledge and make use of not knowledge translate that knowledge into the communicable modern medical aspect and these are the things that i have mentioned next yeah this is how you uh, process with the take take the plant identify the solvent make the extract a particular thing then characterize the compound and characterization at a multiple different approaches or systemic approach and then you study the activities next so um cytotoxic drugs alkylating drugs are there anti metabolites are there topoisomerase inhibitor which works on the dna topology those are also there lots of antibiotics also have been uh, known to come from the uh, phytomedicine next um you can see that phytomedicines is this not a theoretical that i am giving why i have put these slides to show that a molecular biology has also documented meaning some of the phytochemicals have been known to target certain signaling pathways certain megan uh, uh, major uh, global regulators which will make system function in a favored manner or unfavored manner next so it's the same thing map kinase and and uh, different pathways and, and all the names tisetin curcumin these are uh, camphorol resveratrol these are all the anti cancer compound obtained from one or other plant i don't want to go into the details but they their molecular mechanism is there ppp 13k and all those are the different different signaling pathways have been targeted um again next i wouldn't go more into these details uh, let's come down to the our own work next go next next go next yeah so you can see that anti cancer plant potential uh, plant with anti cancer potential you can see the plant potential with anti cancer is 18% then uh, plant with anti cancer potential documented experiment to the 6% plant based anti cancer drugs if you look at that is that is going to be a, a very small percentage anti cancer phytochemicals can be many more more than the actual marketed ones marketed one is a pink color as you see a very thin line uh, graph is shown and large is plant and the cancer so you will see if you go to the literature preliminary studies or or some kind of study or most of them almost 60% of the papers will talk about some aspect of a plant with the uh cancer uh, related things next yeah so i'm going to talk about four plants at uh, four different plant and obviously four different students uh, work i'm going to summarize i will not even acknowledge to my collaborators i will not even acknowledge to the funding agency okay um so this was done very much from one of the student uh, uh worked in latur in coxit at that time nilesh more and uh, he started off his phd with uh, one of the weed arjumun mexicana right and uh, it's known to be a vilayat in our own region and, and uh, that's where we started with to initiate activities about uh, uh, 
uh, whether it is anti cancer or or anti microbial to begin with and and already summarized in one slide itself the whole thing structure is there so that story i will show you next next slide please yeah so this is a papaverasi member next methanolic and the water extracts were carried out next and um, then we had the plates of uh, different uh, microbes were used this is a very typical structure shown for the the flow sh shown for the kirby boy assay shown in 1963 next so there were like antifungals uh, we tested against uh, mucor indicus aspergillus flavus aspergillus niger and penicillium notatum these were the strains from the medical uh, college So obviously, those were the clinical isolate, not the laboratory strain. I've never worked on a laboratory strain. I refuse to work on laboratory strain even today. Next. So um, the amphotericin B was used as a control, and the color for amphotericin B is uh, let's say um, so Lewis extract, then uh, Lewis aqueous extract, methanolic and aqueous extract. in stem aqueous and stem uh, methanolic extract and black colored was a amphotericin you can see at some places the activity in the extract was far better twice than the uh, amphotericin b so that was quite uh, quite interesting for us to proceed further and not to stop just by documenting next so the antibacterial activity was also carried with the clinical strains of uh, bacillus cereus staphylococcus aureus obviously mrs it was and um, one of the esbl strains of e coli extended spectrum beta lactamase producer and the pseudomonas aeruginosa which was also esbl positive so it was found you can see that most of the uh, places except the control condition i don't want to give the detail that is in the paper next so here too it was found the con control was used as streptomycin which is not a beta it is a protein synthesis inhibitor affecting 50s ribosomal subunit so basically it it should be more uh, inhibitory than a beta lactam because normally beta lactams may may not give as much of the uh, the success but still you could see that the activities for the uh, stem cell extract uh, was comparatively better than the activity seen for the streptomycin so it was fair enough in the stem cell extract whether it is antifungal or antibacterial we saw superior activity as compared to the uh, standard control next so mics were established and this is a pictorial diagram how we carry out the, the channel plate 96 well mics next so it was found that uh, uh, antimicrobial uh, mics for the bacillus and pseudomonas ranged into the uh, 200 microgram to the 600 microgram of the extract it is not a purified compound so we don't want to speak about the purified compound per se at this le level it is a total extract only next now the growth for the sake of the growth is ideology of the cancerous cell right virodha la virodh karna in other words so that's the ideology of cancerous cell next so mtt assay that is shown you get a yellow color converted into the uh, purple colored uh, product and that is what you measure as such so anti cancer potential was also tested for Uh, the extracts in three different cell lines a549 ca and kb coming from all three different
next the particular um, eluate from the hplc fraction that was giving same retention time to that of a commercial berberine was then processed for structure elucidation when h nmr and, and c12 and there we could find that um, the spectra of it next slide the uh, berberine so clearly we knew that it is a berberine and that is the compound which is present in the uh, our next, next yeah that's what i said it is the c20h18no4 next this is the structure next so then the, uh, compare now purified our extract that is the eluate from the hplc the commercial berberine and check the activities because what you saw in the crude extract should be there into the purified compound otherwise aapne bol diya ye hai aur bataya to uska activity ni fraction as well as antibiotic and the berberine is shown clear that found is inhibitory so say, second case is a calotropis gigantea ruchika jo apan maruti la हार करतो त्याचं फुलं वगैरे राईट नेक्स्ट सो दिस वॉज स्टडीड अँड अँड अर्लियर पेपर हॅड ऑलरेडी शोन दॅट इट इज रिच विथ द कार्डिनो लाईट्स सो अल्फा कार्डिनो लाईट्स वर लार्जली प्रेझेंट अँड दीज आर सर्टन नेम्स ऑल्सो प्रोव्हायडेड आउट हिअर अँड देन वी प्रोसेस विथ इट नेक्स्ट सो दिजीएम दॅट इज बेसिकली कॅलेट्रॉपिस गँग गायगॅन्शिया मिथेनॉलिक एक्स्ट्रॅक्ट and uh, at a various different concentration the anti cancer activity against mcf16 that's a breast cancer cell line was carried out next then uh, we uh, proposed the studies to see the apoptosis and that was done with the multiple evidences like uh, in the mornings uh, sharma sir has already told your result one is not sufficient you need a multiple evidences so here uh, apoptosis was uh, studied with different com- different approaches and uh, this is a faction with compound paclitaxel that's another phytochemical used as a uh, uh, anti cancer next then uh, caspases are known to be triggered in the uh, apoptosis so caspases was also tested whether it is uh, promoting the apoptosis in the cancerous cell mcf7 the cas was carried out and uh, along with the control of course next paclitaxel was used as a control then cell cycle arrest was also studied and cycle arrest was also that along with the paclitaxel amount of cell cycle arrest was seen uh, with the use of uh, this cgme extract next then uh, tunnel assay that also known to uh, trigger the disintegration of nuclei therefore the tunnel assay was carried out along with the control and it was shown with that too it is in agreement so now caspases are studied facts analysis is to general apoptosis is also studied so you have four, four or five different metabolic processes uh, de- demonstration biochemically uh, have been identified next then towards the end then we wanted to see what happens to the pro apoptotic and anti apoptotic gene expression so this was done with the real time uh, rt pcr studies and that was found that pro apoptotic genes are triggered up that is the uh, back one and back while the anti apoptotic gene bcl2 is repressed in the uh, case of uh, this extracts next so that was sufficient enough to show that the cardinoglyc uh, cardinolites present in the cgme are acting as a um, particularly the um, anti cancerous which one of blend of it that is still under uh, the another approach that we do in the phytochemicals also is a nanoparticle based approach so this next two cases will be related with the nanoparticle next so silver nanoparticle this is very uh, known there are two ways top down and bottom up approach so you can imagine top down is elora caves or ajanta caves this is top down and bottom up is like from the small building a complex one so uh, you can use plant material and microorganisms also next that's the like uh, approach 
just that. Yeah, so synthesis would basically utilize the biological systems, which is rich with a certain uh, then and uh, certain enzymes also, which would participate as a reducing agent and convert uh, that uh, silver nitrate uh, nanoparticle of the uh, silver nanoparticle, which basically changes the property. It's interesting that silver known to be silver color, well, it has no silver color, right? Even that same holds true for the gold. Gold is not yellow in the color at nano level. So the size the property, everything changes as per the size changes. Next. So in general, 10 to 100 nano uh, uh, meter size uh, so far documented uh, nanoparticles from the silver, whether it is a chemically synthesized or uh, green synthesis approach has been used. Next. So the mostly uh, flavonoids and uh, NADH based reactions takes place. This is the chemistry, how it takes place. Next. So one of the plants that we are using here is the Tridex procumbent. Apantala Dagdita Palamanto, which is used as a Jakham Zodi Pan So it is used and it is a very uh, commonly found everywhere in a semi arid area. You don't need to have a rich uh, environment. So there um, uh, we have a practice of leaves used uh, from the traditional medicine background. Leaves are used as a, a wound healer. And wounds mainly are the sites where the microbial infections can take place. So conceivable idea was basically microbial potential, but then we ended up into the anti-cancer stream. Next. So this is how the conversion ABC, you can see buffer for a period of time. Changes the color. Take the temperature pH, the concentration of substrate density, and uh, the type optimize the nanoparticle smaller size and uh, more or less. Zeta potential was studied, uh, 20.7 millivolt, indicating that these are the moderate sized uh, TNPs and 20 to 25 nanometer is between the uh, not too small and not too big also. Next. So FTIR is, is just to show the, um, the functional groups also. Next. So these are the groups which are present onto the nanoparticle because nanoparticle is not alone silver. It is with the phytochemicals and there are certain functional groups of the phytochemical. So there are two things, functional group is different and a chemical is, is a different. So FTIR will give you an idea about the functional groups. It's not a HRCMS or uh, GCMS to give you the structure, right? Next. So the stability was, uh, was tested over a period of time and it was found that they're highly stable. Even we have tested uh, their efficacy after two to three years and it has not been reduced. Next. So uh, in anti-antimicrobial, anti we use, of course, the multiple drug resistant uh, clinical isolates, E. coli, Shigella, Eromonas, and Candida tropicalis. And activities were seen with uh, Eromonas, Shigella, and also E. coli, as well as Candida tropicalis. Next. Now, uh, zones have been recorded. Next. Um, MIC was also calculated with the flow diagram I already have shown you, 
and it was found that for microgram shigel it was too uh, too high 2.5 mg pseudomonas uh, 312 microgram uh, for aeromonas again 2.5 mg and candida it was 1.25 mg now um, the bactericidal concentration minimum was also estimated because mic and bactericidal difference is that the reduction in the three log unit of the growth is mic while complete inhibition is not not phenotypic but the complete lack of cell proliferation is mbc next so uh, we have studied uh, uh, the anti cancer potential of the extract on uh, sorry on the nanoparticle on the a549 that is a lung uh, cancer cell line of human and winblastin another phytochemical based well known anti cancer uh, drug has been used as a control and you can see that uh, in comparison with uh, winblastin the activity could be uh, seen for the uh, particle so we have the extract we have the uh, nanoparticle and um, that's how we check the activity so nanoparticles are far more superior as compared to the extract so extract per se doesn't have as much of activity it's almost uh, it is almost comparable to that of the buffer so next so uh, the, this uh, ic50 concentration per particle and then you also have a extract person so you could see that uh, the activity of uh, tridex nanoparticle uh, nearly 900 to 1000 uh, times superior over the uh, chemically synthesized nanoparticle of silver nitrate next so biofunctionality was also seen because there are lots of report that you can dope it up with the uh, arginine or sort of amino acid so bioavailability therefore can be in increase of the anti cancerous uh, nanoparticle that that too was addressed in this case and it was uh, tested at silver nanoparticle the uh, tridex extract the nanoparticle of silver uh, tridex nanoparticle and then other two cases are the aspergin and arginine uh, doped nanoparticle but we did not see any kind of improvement in the case of uh, doped nanoparticle so the bioavailability was not going to be improved rather it was going against with use of arginine and asparagine next so here again is the same thing that the uh, the activities of the bio um, biosorption asparagine and arginine has been reduced so ic50 values are also reflecting accordingly next now this paper has not been published it is under consideration with uh, shivraj nile is also one of the author of this paper who is sitting here so the qualitative analysis of the phytochemicals <clears throat> is also seen and a large number of uh, groups that i have already told in previous slides could be uh, anti cancerous they are present in this next so the silica gel chromatography uv visible spectra for the nanoparticle has been carried out that is again a 370 nanometer as like the previously uh, for the other thing next then high performance uh, liquid chromatography and has has shown the the spectra visible uh, differently 190 nanometer and 220 nanometer next so there have been found if the nanoparticle is made from the crude extract we make nanoparticle from three different level crude extract then from column chromatography elevate and then from the elevate taken from the hplc so basically the compounds will be reduced as a steps step wise go for it and the final nanoparticle activity is compared from the crude extract based nanoparticle and the hplc elevate based nanoparticle so there that is the way we subtract number of phytochemicals and come for the a real nanoparticle uh, or a real phytochemical which is actually supporting the process of formation of nanoparticle or the anti cancer or both of them together next so there are three been identified as a di uh, amino that is asparagine and and tyrosine so very interesting if you put asparagine it doesn't work 
aspartic tyrosine works right that's quite interesting sometimes you know what happens in nature is beyond your imagination and that's why you have to do research right and there are also two another uh, compounds glutamic acid that's another amino acid but doping those three we don't know at this moment doping with these three is essential together or we have to uh, perform it separately next so the antioxidant activity is was also checked but that's not a big issue that we are going to make it here next so cholinergic assay has been uh, carried further just not by de uh, demonstrating the anti cancer potentiality because not just in bacteria even the drug resistance is issue with the cancer too so the cholinergic uh, uh, assay is is helpful in this case so the experiments were carried out next is Uh, particularly you can see that 2 microgram 5 microgram and 10 microgram concentration of the extracts was carried out and under resistant colonies resistant clones isolates were uh, studied for after uh, treating them for three so you can see that uh, the the cells treated with 10 microgram does not result in any kind of a resistance and tridax has been shown to be Uh, at 10 microgram of concentration of nanoparticle also it gives you more than 50% of uh, uh, lethal lethality in the cell so that is good enough to show that the concentration that you are choosing for the treatment is likely not result into the resistant uh, into the cell so that's very very important this is one of the primary consideration one has to think if you want to take it as a next level molecule next so triple pan blue exclusion and as it was also carried out clonogenic and it was shown that within 24 and 48 hours when you uh, try with a different concentrations uh, uh, you can sell increases uh, more than 90% out of the total that's good enough right that's good enough to show that a resistance is unlikely be a concern next so the uh, the same thing was the mouse uh, melanoma cell and b16 because most of tomorrow if we are to do this and i'm not going to do directly into the human so we are going to do it in mouse so we thought like a skin cell line would be the best thing this was a cancerous uh, cell line but lung in human and since tridax is known to be on the wound which is superficial and the skin so we purposely wanted to test into the skin cell line of the mouse and there also we could see a amount of uh, inhibition next <coughs> wind blasting is used as a control standard one and in the light of wind blasting only we are major next so another the another plant is solanum xanthocarpum next that is again the same thing next these are the parameters used next optimum uh, conditions were again 70 degree ph 7 the concentration it was 2 2 millimolar now it is a 1 millimolar that's good enough 1 is to 10 it was now it is a 2 is to 10 so you can change you can see the changing the plant will also change the ratios and the conditions not all but some next so you visible extra again uh, shows that 410 that is not too far from the 370 next so uh, the size of average size of nano uh, nano particles were uh, 22.45 nanometer and most of them were like uniformly circular here as compared to tridax next um like sd analysis next uh then the zeta potential was also measured minus 19.4 that was again more or less minus 20 in the case of tridax next ftir to show the functional groups next and these are the groups next so antimicrobial activity was tested again the same organisms mostly that was presented for the tridax next can you go further yeah so mic was established mic was also carried out mbc was also carried out next cell cytotoxicity assay was carried out uh put whole fruit nanoparticle and uh, silver nanoparticle so we could see that silver nanoparticle activity after 100 100 100 microgram the activity for the nanoparticle was far superior than the silver nanoparticle uh, silver nanoparticle chemically synthesized next um, that's again a biosorption aspergin and arginine was used and it didn't make much of a difference like in the case of 
uh, tridex, it was same thing. So the nanoparticle had a better activity against the cell line. Next. Silica gel chromatography to see different fractions. The elevates were taken almost 75 out of that. Six elevates are shown. Next. Now the 64 and 65th uh, uh, was having the uh, 420 nanometers UV visible spectra, which was matching to the original 64 was selected for the further anal anal analysis. So the nanoparticle was again synthesized from this particular elevate next and uh, then the absorbance was again reconfirmed next the activities uh, were carried out against the bacteria next and you could see that there were about seven eight compounds which were now doping the uh, part has been published now recently yes next Antioxidant, I'm not going to talk much about it. Next, let's go further. Um, we don't want to go into antioxidant. Next, the same plant. Go ahead. Next, 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 next. Yeah, dandelion is an, yet another plant which is very common into the Himalayan base. Um, just in Himalayan base. And, and this plant has also been very well uh, written in uh, Charak Sanita for its uh, medical potential. So the uh, nanoparticles were also made with this uh, dandelion. Next. Uh, that is a zeta potential studies. Next. Uh, it shows that like, uh, 68 uh, nanometer was the size of nanoparticle amongst whatever we have synthesized this is the largest size of nanoparticles cytotoxicity as he was carried out with 2 microgram 5 microgram 10 microgram and a 20 uh, microgram of the concentration and we could see that with 20 microgram we get the uh, very good results with it of course uh, wind blasting is used as a control next the the fundings from uh, dst has been acknowledged and uh, uh, the students who have worked on this is uh, Nilesh Makwana from JNU, then Rohini uh, Pungreshi Angabad, Nilesh More, who has completed PhD under uh, me only uh, from uh, Coxit. And I'll, I'll stop here only. Uh, you can stop my presentation. If there are questions, I would be uh, happy to take into consideration.
love language of the female. So that's oral words. Uh, but the problem with all the three, they're irreadable. So obviously the Chinese people are not very good. So people have searched more onto the reader people and highly effective. I think you're, am I audible to the last? I'm audible. Okay. So, um, so reversible uh, beta lactamase inhibitors have been taken into consideration. Uh, on the names I have mentioned, avibactam, relabactam, verberobactam, mirobactam, all these are the new searches only. So, of course, for continuous 35 years, there have been a huge amount of research went into discovering antibiotic. It's not that we have not been doing it. The labs are doing it, institutes are doing it, and I myself witness because I come from Rockefeller, which is a big lab at and I love up antibiotic. My boss used to say, Arun, add antibiotic. Every month you'll publish one PNS. I hated antibiotic that time. And now I am doing antibiotics. That's a destiny. Okay. But then the thing is that the resistance to be beaten up and Pfizer at that time, American branch had laid off because after five, six years and five billion dollars, you're not getting one molecule. So how long one can invest money? That's also issue, right? So if there is no productivity, certainly lots of places, people shut down their antimicrobial wings also. And Pfizer was, and, and you, as you know, and as I'm proudly saying that, septazidine, avibactam is an approved crude combination by the Pfizer only, right? So it's not, research is not ongoing and we are hoping that with the plant-based version approach. So what is the reversion approach? Either you have a beta-lactamase inhibitor or the enzyme inhibitor that was inactivating the antibiotic. Beta-lactam probably is one of the class, but there are lots of other different antibiotics. May get the inactivated with the mechanism of resistance. There are four different Antibiotic is inactivated with the enzyme. Antibiotic is modified so that it is not anymore or target site is modified or pump. That's what you said, efflux, right? Pumps, right? It is not just in pseudomonas. It is there in many, many, many. Acinetobacter has. Mycobacterium tuberculosis has. Staphylococcus also is known to have efflux pumps. So efflux pumps are there in common. So this is one of the four different mechanisms of antibiotic resistance presented by the microorganism. So there is a huge amount of research, sir. huge amount of research. Products are not in market because product has not successfully qualified to be able to be marketed. And whatever derivatives, meanwhile, hundreds of derivatives in 35 years have been produced and marketed. Every has failed within six months to one year because the resistance has been found. Aapko se profloxacin pata hoga. Urofloxacin is one of the most fine, uh, fine derivative. Towards the end of uh, 20th century, fluxacin becomes popular over the protein synthesis inhib inhibitors because they were the DNA synthesis inhibitors and considered to, to make a miracle. But then today you will see uh, lots of gram negatives will have resistance to various different uh, fluxacins. You would know that Nortiflox, uh, Nor Nortis was a, a tablet which was like a Norfloxacin and Tinidazole. It is also not responding sometimes which is the third level. It is a by antiparasitic anti as well as antibacterial. So ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, leofloxacin, and now third level is ofloxacin. But ofloxacin is not sufficient alone. Even ornidazole with that, it is not alone. 10 years before it was working. Now it is not working with the same efficiency as it was 10 years before. So that is known. These are all the derivatives of the fluxacins. But again, they suffer. And they suffer the resistance. And that's why people are looking into the two aspects in reversion. You might inhibit the enzyme or you might make antibiotic function up because some other interfering molecules will be titrated. So competitive inhibitor or non-competitive inhibitor kind of approach. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, Sorry, are... if you're all waiting because you're all hungry. <laughs> I think there are no any questions. Professor Arun Karat from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, has given a very nice talk, how to control the cancer. He has highlighted scientific 
methods to control the cancer as well as what are the misunderstanding misthinking about the cancer that is also very well explained by kharas sir so on behalf of this conference i acknowledge him and i request professor elish kamle sir to felicitate professor kharas sir now i request professor beg sir to conclude this session thank you sir please don't worry i'll not taking much of your time <laughs> uh, today in the session in morning session of the second day we had five lectures uh, each lecture was a monumental uh, bioactive uh, phyto compounds properties uh, and its uh, uh, application in female reproduction health by achin sharma then second lecture was by benjak also doubt for uh, uh, better replacement of fish residues then we had uh, a monumental lecture by uh, gurunath uh, pillai stressing on uh, what's next for drug discovery then we have uh, dr swati peshwe uh, stressing on enzyme microbial enzyme and their application and lastly but not least uh, a uh, very interesting and very fascinating lecture by dr arun kharat on sustain sorry on this uh, phytochemical as potential anti anti cancer and anti microbial on behalf of school of life sciences on behalf of saman tirth maratha university on behalf of the organizing committee on behalf of organizing committee of this and all who are the associated i thanks all these speakers for uh, delivering exceptional lectures and enlightening all uh, all of us uh, with the knowledge and uh, i on my personal behalf and my colleague uh, karippa sir's behalf and the speaker for your patience lecture and the deliberation thank you now you all are waiting for lunch so lunch is uh, arranged at school of life sciences and we'll resume here at sharp 3 pm so next lectures will start at sharp 3 pm so please enjoy the lunch at school of life sciences thank you very much <laughs>